The committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder, I ask all members to keep themselves muted when they're not being recognized. The staff have been this instructed is being recorded. not to mute members except where a member is not being recognized and there is inadvertent background noise. Members are also reminded that they may only participate in one remote proceeding at a time. If you're participating today, please keep your camera on. And if you choose to attend a different remote proceeding, please turn your camera off. Additionally, I want to announce that for this hearing, it is my intention to recess the committee for five minutes every two hours. Lastly, before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Congresswoman Alma Items, who is celebrating her 75th birthday today. Happy birthday, Congresswoman Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Happy Thank birthday. You so much. <laughs> Thank you. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, this committee convenes for a hearing entitled Holding Mega Banks Accountable, an update on banking practices, programs, and policies. And of course, you know, testifying before the committee today, we will have the CEOs of J. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and Goldman Sachs, who testified before the Senate yesterday. And today's testimony concludes two historic days, which are a true testament of the accountability that comes from democratic control of the House and Senate. As chairwoman of this committee, I have made it a priority to ensure that we're conducting rigorous oversight over mega banks and their activities. We last had all of the mega bank CEOs to testify before the committee in 2019. Since then, there have been many developments involving mega banks that this committee will be examining today. I'm eager to hear about the mega banks response to the pandemic crisis, including their provision of mortgage forbearance, affordable loan modifications, support for extending the foreclosure moratorium and paycheck protection programs, loans. I'm concerned that the institutions led by our witnesses raked in billions in overdraft fees during the pandemic at a time when so many individuals and families across the country are struggling through no fault of their own. Additionally, some of our banks prioritize wealthier clients for PPP lending while processing smaller loans at a much slower rate, or in some cases, turning small and minority-owned business away altogether. We heard so much about this from all over the country. I've also asked our witnesses to describe their institution's efforts to reach underserved communities and address banking deserts where communities do not have access uh, to a bank branch. The four largest banks have closed thousands of bank branches over the past decade. And I'm concerned that this is exacerbating the bank desert problem and harming communities that rely on branches for basic banking services. This week also marks the tragic anniversary of the murder of George Floyd, the black man, the white police officers, which focused America's attention on racial injustice in this country. The mega banks responded by making a number of large commitments to support minority depository institutions, community development, financial institutions, and communities of color. Given that these banks have repeatedly been found to discriminate against our communities, the CEOs will be asked to explain if their banks are following through on those commitments and to learn what additional actions they will take this year to address racial disparities that remain pervasive in our banking system. I'm also looking forward to hearing from our witnesses about their progress improving the diversity and inclusion of their senior leadership their boards and their investment in diverse owned firms. Diverse representation at senior levels is key to ensuring a fair and equitable recovery for all communities. 
There are many other topics of interest to this committee that we will address today, including banks' wages for their employees and compensation for their CEOs, their use of emerging technology, such as artificial intelligence or products like cryptocurrency, the recent growth of mega banks and mega banks actions to address climate risk. I look forward to hearing testimony from all of our witnesses today. I now to recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry for four minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we're here today for the sequel that nobody asked for. In 2019, Democrats held this exact hearing to grill you CEOs on everything from firm size to your salaries. Republicans in that hearing used the hearing to focus on systemic risk issues to our current financial system. Clearly, none of us could have predicted what could have happened or what, what would happen just one year later. The pandemic presented us with a once in a generation challenge. Congress, the Fed, and Treasury stood together and met this crisis head on. Your institutions also played a critical role, as did the financial system, generally speaking, banks of all sizes and credit unions of all sizes, and fintechs, making sure that support was available to families and small businesses. You deserve some credit for that. So where are we now? Nearly 50% of adult Americans have been fully vaccinated. Businesses are starting to reopen. And we should be talking about the amazing recovery that has taken place. But I also am very concerned about some of the troubling data that is starting to emerge. The April data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics showed that unemployment, uh, unemployment increased uh, uh, by only 266,000 people. At the same time, we have more than 8 million jobs remain unfilled. Businesses are struggling to hire workers and the cost of household goods is rising sharply. Our economy is at a fragile moment right now. To be clear, I agree that things are looking up and that's great, but make no mistake, there are some very troubling signs ahead. So our focus must be on jobs and getting people back to work. That is what Republicans are doing. In fact, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, 17 out of the 20 states led by Republicans, are recovering jobs the fastest. But Democrats seem to have other priorities. Their so-called American Rescue Plan actively discourage people from returning to work. And now they're preparing to ram through trillions of dollars more in spending and massive tax hikes, all under the guise of quote-unquote infrastructure. Well, Americans are quite literally being forced to pick up the tab for Democrats' progressive agenda items. And our witnesses might be wondering what this has to do with them. Well, I think this is a cautionary tale to be careful what you wish for. My colleagues on the other side of the aisle want you, bank CEOs, to focus on political activism instead of doing what your institutions do best, which is provide capital and serve customers. As we learned in COVID, when you mix science and politics, you get politics. And as we're learning now, when you mix business and politics, you get politics. Well, you may say, some may say, come on in, the water's fine, but our political waters are quite troubling and we don't need the business world to become the political world. I don't think we're better for that and our economy's better for that. And shunning law-abiding businesses to appease to the woke left as well won't help employers, won't help our economy recover, won't help uh, the average working person in America. Instead, we should be working together on a shared goal of rebuilding the greatest economy in the world that we had pre-COVID and moving forward. Speaking of moving forward, Madam Chair, when will this committee get back to normal? We want to urge normalcy for the American economy and for the American people. For months now, we've gone back and forth about returning to in-person hearings with the option for members to join remotely. I think that's a reasonable request again today. I also think the American people we represent uh, would be pretty ticked off if they knew we weren't going back to work for them uh, and not doing what they have to do on a daily basis. I'm encouraged by uh, vaccines being widely available and us being able to so follow safety protocols available. So 
Uh, CEOs, I look forward to your testimony. I look forward to the questions today. Um, and uh, looking forward to all of us getting back to normal as soon as possible, especially Congress getting back to the work of the American people. Thanks so much, and you yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, at this point in time, uh, I'm going to call on Mr. Perlmutter uh, for one minute for an opening statement. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. And I want to thank our panel for their leadership during this pandemic. Uh, none of us expected it, and just thank you for your leadership. The last 15 months have been challenging for our country, but through the leadership of the Biden administration, 50% of Americans are fully or partially vaccinated. Yeah, they were wondering. The uh, and the American Rescue Plan has provided relief to many communities through economic impact payments, help for small businesses, and support for state and local governments. <clears throat> Unfortunately, many Americans remain vulnerable, and there is still uncertainty in our economy. Financial institutions and their employees have been on the front lines of delivering PPP loans to small businesses and working with consumers impacted by the pandemic. As chief executive officers, I'd like you to focus on two things, keeping, their, keeping your institutions safe and sound, and assure second, assuring that everyone has access to banking services and all are treated fairly and honestly without fear of sharp or abusive practices. With that, I yield back. I now recognize a gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel for testifying today. In the past decade, we have seen a trend where the liberal left has tried to use financial institutions to eliminate legally operating industries they do not like, from gun manufacturers to energy companies. This was first attempted under Operation Choke Point, where financial regulators in the Obama administration forced banks to cut services to certain industries. While the last administration largely stopped that, the left now has a new method of accomplishing their goal, publicly naming and shaming financial institutions and applying political pressure to drop companies. In fact, some members of the committee publicly urged you to unbank certain industries at this same hearing in 2019. Unfortunately, a number of banks represented here today have been all too eager to comply, making them willing participants in the systemic unbanking of legally operating businesses in this country, in contrast to investments and operations in other parts of the world. Today, I look forward to hearing why. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, I ask unanimous consent uh, to respond to an issue, a very important issue uh, that was raised by Mr. McHenry and engage him in a small, uh, limited colloquy. Uh, I wanna thank the ranking member for his comments and his letter. As has been the case throughout the pandemic, the health and safety of members and staff are of the highest importance. It is my intention to continue to conduct this committee's proceedings in a manner that is safe and in accordance with the most recent advice from medical experts. Now that we have updated guidance from both the CDC and the Office of the Attendant Physician, I'm working with staff to think through how we can adjust committee protocols to allow for hybrid committee meetings. I will note that the latest guidance from the Office of the Attending Physician and the corresponding flexibilities around social distancing and mask wearing are specific to those who have been fully vaccinated. Those who have not yet been fully vaccinated or who are vaccine indeterminate are still strongly advised to wear masks and social distance. Further, the updated guidance specifies that there should be continued mass wear and social distancing in committee meetings due in part to the substantial number of people who are not yet fully vaccinated or who are vaccine indeterminate. Therefore, I look forward to working with the ranking member to ensure that we are verifying the vaccination status of all individuals who are attending in person at committee meetings, including members and staff, I welcome further conversation with the ranking member on how we can move to hybrid proceedings safely without creating unintended issues such as additional technical issues or concerns regarding uneven participation, considering we cannot accommodate all members and persons at this time. And I will yield to the ranking member for a limited time for this colloquy. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, responding in, in some context to my letter. What I raised in my letter was that this committee operated in person 
in a, and in a hybrid format before vaccines were distributed to the public. And I'm asking the chair to return to her standard, which was then the case. That is, uh, that was a standard well beyond what the attending physician recommended then, and is again the case now. We need to show the American people that we can safely reemerge. Everyone that wants a vaccine has had the option to get it. In fact, Congress was one of the first uh, first uh, branches, the first group of people in the country and in the world uh, that had vaccines available. So all the members that uh, want vaccines have had ample time to do this. And what I'm asking is for us to return safely to work uh, as a sign to the American people that we can do our business and get it done. The digital format as, as members and as the public will see today is a fairly mis miserable one uh, given the nature of this technology and with a load on this technology. We were better off with in-person uh, hearings just like we are, like just how we operate when we have markups and committee markups where we've been hybrid. And, and the minority has been uh, quite uh, willing to work with you and the majority on doing this safely as we did in the midst of the pandemic before vaccines were available. So the answers right now, uh, I think are way too limited, far more limited to, than what the science indicates, number one. And number two, there's no provision under House rules by which a committee chair or the Speaker of the House can, can verify somebody's health records. And in fact, uh, important seminal health privacy laws in this country also ward against that. I am vaccinated and I'm proudly vaccinated and I think it is the safest vaccine brought to market in global history and my family's benefited from us. Let's show that we can actually get back to work and be an example for the American people, rather than having uh, this absurdity that we can't be back together safely. And with, with that, I yield back and uh, certainly understand that we can continue this dialogue in the coming I'm just Absolutely. here uh, for raising it, and uh, I yield Thank back. Thank you. I thank you so very much. Yes, we must continue this dialogue. I'm very proud to announce uh, that the entire Democratic caucus have been vaccinated, and I'll leave it up to you uh, to deal with your caucus on how you guys are going well, to deal with that. You, Madam Chair, yes. I, I, uh, uh, on those health records, uh, as a member of Congress, I have expressed that I am vaccinated. I'm going to leave it up to members to, to uh, talk about their own health status under their own regard. But Madam Chair, as you and I know, uh, you've got one of the best uh, health records in Congress, and uh, I, I don't, I, you know, you fear no person. So uh, I am, I'm confident sitting next to you that I am well fortified and protected. And with that, you'll back. Uh, I'm so proud of the Democratic Caucus, and, and I would hope that you would do everything that you can to encourage the members of your caucus uh, to be in the safety mode for all of us and encourage them uh, to be vaccinated. I'm going to move on and now. First, we have Thank Mr. James Diamond, the chairman and chief executive officer at J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. Um, so... Um, Next, we will have Ms. Jane Frazier, the Chief Executive Officer at Citigroup. And then Mr. James P. Gorman, the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer at Morgan Stanley. Next, we will have Mr. Brian T. Moynihan, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Bank of America. And then Mr. Charles uh, F. Sheriff, Chief Executive Officer and President Wells Fargo and Company. Finally, we will have Mr. David M. Solomon, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Goldman Sachs. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. Each of you will have five minutes to summarize your testimony. You should be able to see a timer on your screen that will indicate how much time you have left. And a time will go off at the end of your time. I would ask you to be mindful of the timer and quickly wrap up your testimony if you hear the chime. Before we begin with your oral testimonies, I would like to swear the witnesses in. I will call each of your names individually to respond. Would all of you please raise your right hands? Thank you. Do you solemnly swear to affirm that the testimony you will give before this committee in the matters now under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Mr. Diamond? Yes. Mrs. Ms. Frazier? Yes. Mr. Gorman? Yes. 
Mr. Monihan? Yes. Mr. Schroff? Yes. Mr. Solomon? Yes. Let the record show that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. We will now begin with their oral testimonies. Mr. Diamond, you are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry and distinguished members of the committee, I, the proud grandson of Greek immigrants, appreciate the invitation to appear before you to talk about J.P. Morgan Chase, including the people, businesses, and communities we serve. We are living through unprecedented times for which history will judge the leaders of government and industry by actions we take to address the health and economic crises and longstanding structural inequities. At J.P. Morgan Chase, we entered this crisis from a position of strength and leveraged our size and scale to contribute to the stability in our country and ongoing support for the real economy, our customers, employees, and communities impacted by the global crisis. In 2020, we extended credit and raised capital totaling 2.3 trillion for customers and businesses of all sizes, helping them meet payroll, avoid layoffs, and support operations. We waived fees and delayed payments on about 3 million accounts for customers who said they were affected by COVID with no questions asked. We waived over $600 million in fees for COVID and non-COVID reasons, including over 400 million in overdraft fees. We funded over 400,000 PPP loans to small business, supporting over 3 million jobs for more than 40 billion in total funding. About 90% went to businesses with fewer than 20 employees, and around one third went to businesses and communities of color. Outside of PPP, we provide 18 billion in new and renewed credit for small business. We committed 250 million in business and philanthropic initiatives with a focus in helping underserved small businesses, not profits. And we support our employees, especially our frontline workers, of which something like 75,000 went to work every day, including me, for the most part, who continue to show up to their jobs and branches, call centers, lock boxes, and other roles that could not be done at home. We gave special time payments, additional pay time off, and continue to pay for regularly scheduled hours, even when hours were reduced. There's no doubt that the bold and swift action taken by Congress, you all, the Federal Reserve, and the administrations over the past 15 months were instrumental in reversing financial panic and avoiding a deep and lasting economic crisis. But the last year exacerbated longstanding inequality, particularly among Black and Latinx families, increasing barriers to wealth creation and holding us back as a country. This is why J.P. Morgan Chase recently committed an additional $30 billion over five years to address racial economic inequality, focusing on expanding affordable housing, growing Black and Latinx owned businesses, and improving access to banking. These are new business commitments that will help to drive real change. We've already made solid progress and are on track for a five-year commitment. We've refinanced over $2 billion in mortgages for Black and Latinx households and have funded investments and loans for an additional 5,500 multifamily affordable housing units. We funded over $60 million in investments in nine MDIs. We also opened community center branches in areas like Harlem, Chicago, Minneapolis, and Crenshaw, with many more coming in the next year. At J.P. Morgan Chase, we consider our people to be our greatest strength. Our 160,000 U.S. employees are located in 38 states and soon will be in 48 contiguous states this summer. 30% of the new branches are open and are located in low to moderate income households, and nearly one third of all branches are in minority census tracts. For the third time in five years this year, we increase entry level wages to $16 to $20 an hour, and we provide annual benefit packages worth about $13,000. Nearly 70% of our employees who started before 2017 with a salary less than 40000 are still at the company and experienced an average increase of 40% in compensation. We've also made progress in recruiting, retaining, and promoting ethnically diverse employees. Over the past five years, for example, we've increased the number of black senior leaders by more than 50% and established a new program that holds managers accountable for the diversity of priorities through compensation and performance evaluations. Our country is poised for a strong economic rebound, but we must ensure the economic recovery benefits all and we address longstanding inequities that threaten the promise of America. Access to affordable health care and education system that's failing too many of our children, crumbling infrastructure, climate change, and racial inequality are some of the problems challenging our great nation. All of us, government, business, and civic society must work with a common purpose to address these challenges. I want to close by thanking our employees for their tireless work and relentless focus on doing what's right for our customers. 
They have performed their jobs with integrity and commitment to serve our customers and our country. I look forward to working with you all as we shape our future of our country for generations to come. We all share a collective American interest to ensure that we are a country of unlimited opportunity for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Diamond. We will now go to Ms. Frazier. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you, Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee. And thank you very much for the opportunity to represent City today. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Jane Fraser. I joined the bank 17 years ago, and I became CEO in March. Um, I grew up in a small village in Scotland, but I first came to the US in 1987. And I very proudly became a citizen in 2001. My husband immigrated to the US from Cuba when he was a young boy, and he's also a proud citizen of our country. So we both feel very fortunate about the opportunities this country has created for our family, and we believe we have an obligation to make sure everyone can participate in the American dream. At City, we recognize this has been an incredibly challenging time for Americans, millions of whom we're very proud to call our customers. The origins of this global crisis are very unlike the last one. This is a public health crisis with severe economic consequences for many. Through the pandemic, City has shown we are a very different bank than the one that entered the financial crisis more than a decade ago. We're smaller, but we're safer, we're stronger, and we're far less complex. Um, we have had the financial resources to support our clients and communities through COVID, and we're laser focused on driving a sustainable and an equitable recovery. I'll always be proud that we were the first bank to provide relief programs for retail and small business customers in the US. We're also proud to be a reliable conduit for the extraordinary consumer and business aid that Congress and the Federal Reserve have provided. We helped deliver this aid across many government sponsored programs, including the Paycheck Protection Program. As a result of the tremendous need from small businesses, we went from being a relatively small SBA lender to so far funding over $5 billion in PPP loans to the hardest hit small businesses. And nearly 80% of these loans have gone to businesses with 10 or fewer employees. And we're donating all the net profits from the program to provide further support to vulnerable small businesses and communities in the US. And at the same time, we've made our own people a priority. And we provided them special compensation awards and benefits to many of our colleagues to help them ease their personal financial burden and worries through the crisis. As the world's most global bank, we will continue supporting many of the most iconic American businesses as they navigate the uncertainty of markets abroad. And working in concert with federal assistance programs, we're going to continue to serve as a source of strength for our customers and our communities here at home as a very high priority. While we have a smaller branch footprint than our peers, we will harness the full power of our bank's capabilities to extend our reach and to help make sure the recovery leaves no one behind. We're proud of our record of enabling opportunity in communities. For 11 straight years, we've been the number one lender of affordable housing in the US. And in 2020 alone, we worked with the state and local governments to finance over $27 billion in vital capital projects such as roads and schools, hospitals and utilities. And through low cost and no fee products, we continue expanding financial services in underbanked neighborhoods. Almost exactly a year ago, as calls for social justice rang out in the wake of George Floyd's murder, City answered those calls with action. We launched a firm wide effort, including a billion dollars in strategic initiatives to help close the racial wealth gap. And just this morning, we announced a new $200 million program to invest in affordable housing and workforce projects with black investment managers. We're not alone in our commitment to equity, but what distinguishes us is how we hold ourselves accountable for results. And where we have more work to do, we're very upfront about it. This is the transparency that's defined our representation goals and our efforts to close our gender pay gap. It's also part of our sustainability agenda 
and our commitment to net zero emissions by 2050, which I announced on my first day as CEO, because helping our clients transition to a low carbon economy is going to be central to this work. I'm determined for City to continue leading on these issues. They're central to our mission of enabling growth and progress. And I thank you again for the opportunity to talk about City's efforts to be part of the solution and the recovery to this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Frazier. Next, we will go to Mr. Gorman. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Uh, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee, uh, thank you for having me here again today. Um, I'm also an immigrant uh, coming from Australia, and let me tell you, it's a long journey from Melbourne to New York, and I'm very proud that I made it, and I'm now a citizen of this great country. When we were last here in 2019, none of us could have predicted the extraordinary public health crisis that would unfold around the world. We remain in the midst of the crisis that has caused serious humanitarian and economic issues, leaving an indelible mark on many of us. Our hearts go out to all of those directly and indirectly impacted by this crisis. In response to these extraordinary and challenging times, we were focused on serving our clients and our communities and taking care of our employees. We helped our corporate and institutional clients raise additional liquidity and obtain financing. We raised over $50 billion of capital for the industry sectors most affected by COVID, the airlines, the cruise ships, the travel industry. Our teams also helped raise healthcare capital for both Moderna and Pfizer, including a sustainable bond issuance by Pfizer to support patient access to medicines and vaccines, especially among underserved populations. For our retail clients, we guided them to manage their investment portfolios amidst extreme volatility. Today's Morgan Stanley, through its three businesses, provides a stable foundation of support in any market environment. In our institutional business, we're a financial advisor to companies. We help them raise debt and equity capital, from taking companies public to helping them issue bonds so they can grow and create jobs. We help public sector entities raise municipal financing. We help pension funds, mutual funds, and other financial institutions trade and manage assets. In our other two businesses, wealth and asset management, we manage over $5.6 trillion of assets for households and institutions, including endowments, pension funds that manage the retirements of our teachers, firefighters, and other public service employees. For millions of US households, our services help families save money, whether that be for college payments, retirement, or to put a down payment on their mortgages. Beyond our day-to-day -day core businesses, we also support the more vulnerable in our communities through philanthropic and employee engagement. A number of well-publicized events last year led to a heightened and necessary focus on racial and social justice and a recognition that explicit support and purposeful collective action will be required. Some of our efforts in the last year included providing grants to minority depository institutions to help them bolster their loan loss reserves in the wake of the pandemic, and to assist minority and women-owned businesses to ensure an equitable recovery. We started a program to provide 60 students with full four-year scholarships to Howard University, Morehouse College, and Spelman College, three of America's leading historically black colleges and universities. In addition, we're concerned like everyone with how to deal with climate risk over the next decades, which will have profound socioeconomic effects on our communities. Morgan Stanley recognizes the threat that global change, climate change poses, and we're working with our clients to find ways to mitigate it. Finally, early in the pandemic, we committed to making no reductions in our workforce through 2020 to help our employees navigate this crisis, thereby providing reassurance to 70,000 families in a very difficult time. I'm proud of that commitment and the commitment our employees have shown to their clients. Chairwoman Waters, in your letter dated April 30, 2021, you asked me to provide information on 14 topics. 
In the spirit of brevity, that information is now included in the attached addendum, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Uh, or yes, we cannot hear you. Okay, it keeps changing. Okay, we're back now. Uh, I want to thank you, Mr. Gorman. Next, we will go to Mr. Moynihan. You are now recognized for five minutes to your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and distinguished committee members. At Bank of America, we serve one in two American households, and my 200,000 plus teammates and I take that responsibility very seriously. Our incredible team interacts with clients tens of millions of times a day. We do throw, so through our 4,300 financial centers, one third of which are located in LMI communities, 17,000 ATMs on the phone and through our digital capabilities with 40 million active digital users. In 2020, our clients turned to us for support like they hadn't done before. Thanks to years of investment and our focus on responsible growth, our teammates were there to support those in need. And through it all, a growing number of clients have placed their trust in us. Since the start of the healthcare crisis, deposits have increased significantly and our customer base has grown across all our businesses. We helped our clients and the U.S. economy through the worst economic shock in recent years. For clients in need, we deliver financial assistance through our business as usual work and by helpfully helping deliver the timely federal relief programs that you and your colleagues authorized. We helped nearly 2 million consumers and small businesses defer payments on credit cards, vehicle loans, and home loans. Even with a deferral, the vast majority of these clients remain current on their payments, and that is a good thing. We provided PPP loans to nearly one half million small businesses. 83% of those loans have gone to businesses with 10 or few employees, and nearly 40% have gone to businesses in majority minority communities. We sent millions of emails to help clients understand the program and encourage them to apply, including target outreach to drive awareness to all communities. Apart from PPP, we remain the largest lender to small business in the United States, according to the FDIC, with $35 billion in small business loan balances, 60% of which is now in my communities. We also processed more than $73 billion in stimulus payments authorized by Congress and took additional steps to help overdrawn clients access their full payment without any offset. The products and services we provide are essential to our clients, to our communities and economy, and we continue to take steps to help our clients' day-to-day -day financial needs. In 2020, as a complement to our successful Safe Balance No Overdraft Checking Account, we launched Balance Assist, a low-cost, digital-only alternative to payday-type loans, allowing clients in need to borrow up to $500 for a flat fee with no interest. We also increased investments in our team during the pandemic. We expanded many of we expanded many of our benefits, including support for mental health, free virtual medical consultations, and no-cost coronavirus te testing. We offered teammates $100 per day to hire someone to come into their home to take care of their children or their adult dependents. We have funded more than 4 million days of care for our teammates. We implemented coronavirus testing and daily health screening installed wellness barriers in all our branches. We provided special compensation programs for our teammates, including supplemental pay and enhanced overtime pay as well as transportation and meal subsidies, and we had no layoffs in 2020. We ensure that all employees are compensated well. Last year, we increased our minimum hourly wage rate of pay for, for U.S. teammates to $20, one year earlier than planned, and we committed to raise that to $25 per hour by 20, 2025. Vendors within the United States also required to provide wages at or above $15 per hour if they serve us. Today, thousands of vendor employees have benefited by this. Since 2012, we have not increased medical premiums for teammates earning less than $50,000. For 2020, we provided special compensation awards to 97% of our talent team globally, the fourth straight year we've done so. Maintaining our diverse and inclusive work workplace also continues to be a priority. 50% of our management team and 50% of our board of directors is diverse. More than half our global workforce is women, and 45% of our U.S.-based teammates are people of color. 
We hired and trained more than 10,000 employees from LMI communities in the last three years alone. Finally, over the past year, we increased our investments to support our communities. In June 2020, we accelerated our longstanding work to promote racial equality and economic opportunity to drive investment in jobs, small business, housing, and health care to our local communities. We have committed $1.25 billion over five years and have already deployed $350 million of that, including common equity capital investments in 17 MBIs and CDFIs, investments in 90 private equity funds that are both run by minority women entrepreneurs and also focus on minority and women-owned businesses. 29 million masks and other PPE to uh, underserved communities and community centers. We increased our home ownership assistance program to raise the goal from $5 billion to $15 billion. We also accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy. We are committed at Bank of America to achieve net zero greenhouse emissions before 2050. We are working alongside and supporting our clients in every industry to help make that transition. We at Bank of America believe in capitalism and believe it's the best way to solve the changes facing society. We can deliver for our shareholders and for society. We call that responsible growth, and thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Monahan. Now we will go to Mr. Shaw. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, members of the committee, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Just over a year ago, I appeared before this committee upon assuming my role as CEO. We were on the verge of a global pandemic, and I cannot help but look back and think how little we understood of what 2020 would bring. When the pandemic struck, we all came together to stand up unprecedented assistance at a scale and speed that had never been done before. Though the process was not perfect, we, the government, and others rallied to do what needed to be done and now we must continue to work together to ensure a fair and equitable recovery. As we begin taking steps towards recovery, I'm proud of Wells Fargo's efforts to support our customers, our employees, and the communities we serve, all while continuing to transform our organization. I believe our countries and communities benefit from a strong Wells Fargo. I'm proud that we've been a source of strength for our customers and communities during the toughest of times. They are our core and must remain our priority in all we do. To support our customers during the pandemic, we deferred payments and waived fees for more than 3.7 million consumer and small business accounts to help people to make ends meet. We provided over 1 million mortgage forbearances and suspended residential property foreclosures and evictions to keep Americans in their homes. And we acted as a leading lender in the Paycheck Protection Program funding more than $13.7 billion in aid to small businesses. Over 40% of our loans were made to businesses located in low to moderate income or majority minority census tracts. Recognizing that the goal of the PPP was to provide a lifeline to struggling small businesses, we also took more than the $400 million in fees generated by the program in 2020 and are donating them to our Open for Business Fund, which is allowing us to engage CDFIs not-for-profits and others to help businesses manage the economic effects of COVID-19. And we will continue to do our part by working on solutions to tackle the problem of unbanked and underbanked individuals and other efforts to foster an inclusive recovery. We look forward to defeating the impact of the pandemic together and believe Wells Fargo will play an important role to helping rebuild a stronger America. To our employees, I'm proud of the work you've done over the past year to support our customers and communities during these uncertain times. We prioritize safety and well-being, and my deepest gratitude goes out to our frontline workers who made it possible to keep branches safely open. We transitioned more than 200,000 employees to remote work last March, and we understood the tremendous strain the pandemic would place on all of our employees and the families. We made special cash awards to approximately 165,000 employees, offered enhanced support for employees who are parents or caregivers, provided free voluntary COVID-19 testing for all employees working in a Wells Fargo location, and offered paid time off to employees, I'm sorry, we offer paid time offer, paid time off to employees for vaccination appointments. For the communities we serve, we continued to invest in the institutions critical to their success. While we're very encouraged to be seeing signs of improvement, we realize that not all of our communities are benefiting equally in the recovery. That is why Wells Fargo 
has been working to support a more inclusive economic recovery with a focus on racial and social equity, economic mobility, and investments in low to moderate income communities. For example, we're investing in black owned minority deposit institutions across the country as part of our $50 million commitment to support MDIs. And we've given more than $150 million to CDFIs around the country who are providing grants to hard hit small businesses. Additionally, last week, we announced our banking inclusion initiative, a 10 year commitment to accelerate unbanked individuals access to affordable mainstream accounts and helped unbanked communities have easier access to low cost banking. We are also committed to helping transition to a low carbon economy and have set a goal of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions, including our financed emissions by 2050. And finally, for our company, while we still have significant work to do, we are committed to, voting, to devoting the resources necessary to operate with strong business practices and controls, maintain the highest levels of integrity, and have an appropriate culture in place. Thank you again for having me, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schaff. Finally, we will go to Mr. Solomon. You are now recognized for five minutes to present your oral testimony. Thank you, Chairman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the committee. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. These last 14 months have been an incredibly challenging time as the pandemic has swept across the world, killing almost 600,000 Americans and plunging us into a steep economic retraction. Even today, our hearts go out to the people of India and others around the world who continue to suffer from this virus. However, because of the swift actions taken by Congress, the Federal Reserve, and others to combat this health and economic crisis, I am optimistic about our future. As more people are vaccinated, the U.S. is poised for a very strong recovery. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and AstraZeneca for the amazing work they and others have done on life-saving vaccines. The banking industry performed well during this crisis, as the Fed's two stress tests in 2020 confirmed. This is due in part to the Dodd-Frank Act and other financial regulations put in place since the 2008 crisis. Goldman Sachs remained well capitalized both leading up to and throughout the pandemic. Goldman Sachs has more than 40,000 employees and I continue to be in awe of their resilience. To help them through the pandemic, we gave people an additional 10 days of paid family leave, expanded access to child and adult care, offered free telemedicine and rolled out a global COVID testing regime. In addition, we've continued to pay our on-site vendor staff whether they worked or not. That includes our mailroom staff, cafeteria workers, security guards, and janitorial staff. Over the last year, we experienced historically elevated levels of client demand. And because we were well capitalized, we were able to help our corporate clients weather the impact of COVID-19 and position themselves for a post-pandemic recovery. For our digital bank customers, we launched a COVID customer assistance program, which allowed customers to defer loan payments for four months and credit card payments for six months at no additional cost. We also found innovative ways to support small businesses. We are not an SBA lender, so we did not participate directly in the Paycheck Protection Program. Instead, we committed one and a quarter billion dollars in capital to community development, financial institutions, and mission-driven lenders who facilitated PPP loans across the country. The capital we deployed with our CDFI partners reached very small businesses, nearly half of which are in minority communities. The average loan size is around $43,000, and the median employee count is two. In addition, last week, we committed another $1 billion in partnership with the SBA and our CDFI partner, Lendistry, to fund approximately 40,000 PPP loans, over half of which will benefit minority-owned businesses. We did this to ensure these applicants were able to have their loans processed and approved before the PPP funds were exhausted. We also continue to support small businesses through our 10,000 Small Businesses Program, launched in 2010. This program, through this program, we provide education by partnering with community colleges and greater access to capital to thousands of small businesses. Last year, we committed an additional $250 million to serve another 10,000 small business owners. We've also committed an additional $500 million to our program for diverse entrepreneurs, launched with GS. I now want to focus on three other initiatives that are incredibly important to us. 
First, we've already achieved more than a fifth of our 10-year target of $750 billion in financing, investing, and advisory activity focused on climate transition and inclusive growth. We've been carbon neutral across our operations since 2015, and we recently set a goal of net carbon carbon zero of net zero carbon emissions in our supply chain by 2030. Second, we commissioned extensive research on how to mitigate income inequality, which showed that black women are one of the most marginalized groups in this country. It found that if we can reduce the earnings gap for black women, we could see US GDP increase by $300 billion a year. In response, we developed a new initiative called One Million Black Women, where we will invest $10 billion over the next 10 years to narrow opportunity gaps for at least 1 million black women in the US. The final initiative relates to our diversity and inclusion. When I became CEO two and a half years ago, I said this would be a top priority. Since I last testified before Congress, we have made progress. Our board will now have six out of 13 directors who are women and will be 62% diverse by race, gender, or sexual orientation. Our newest partner class includes the highest percentage of women and black partners in our history. In addition, our 2020 campus analyst class in the Americas was 55% women and 11% black talent, our highest ever. However, I'm not satisfied where we are, and we continue to work to address this. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Um, I'm going to uh, go to a question that I had not anticipated at this point, because I wanted to talk about uh, these low-cost homes. But let me just ask, uh, we have, you know, supported forbearance, and some of you certainly have been very good at doing that. However, we're getting a lot of concerns about homeowners, many of whom have lived in their homes for 15 and 20 years, and because of the pandemic, uh, they found themselves with difficulty. They were laid off from their jobs, uh, the jobs closed down, or uh, whatever. They could not afford to pay their mortgages in the same way that they had been doing for many, many years. And we had forbearance in the CARES Act, I believe, and also uh, in the uh, American Relief Plan. Now that foreclosure um, moratorium ends around June 30th for those who have been into forbearance. I wanna know from each of you, how many of you are going to offer uh, the uh, these uh, homeowners an opportunity for loan modifications, real loan modifications? They, even if they don't know about them, are you gonna initiate them? Are you going to deal with them in ways that will help save their homes and avoid foreclosure? Let me start right out with Jamie Diamond. Yes, uh, can you tell me uh, whether or not you are going to employ uh, the kind of operation that we won't have to get into a confrontation about, uh, that we don't have to try and do something in law? You are going to initiate this program. Well, I can't promise you that because I don't know the details, but we don't like foreclosing on people. We give modifications. We have plans. We'll work with everyone, and we're appropriate. We will not be foreclosing on people. I do want to point out there are some appropriate where the homes are vacant, the people have been paying for years, they're vacation homes, they're second homes. So where appropriate, you can expect us to bend over backwards to help those folks stay in their homes. Thank you very much, Mr. Diamond. I described uh, uh, the kind of homeowner uh, that would be looking for a loan modification. I didn't talk about any houses that were boarded up and uh, no one was there and all of that. I took an opportunity to describe that. I'm going to hold you to it. Uh, let me go on to Ms. Frazier. Um, thank you very much, Chairwoman Waters. Uh, we do no, we no longer um, service our own mortgages. We do so with um, our part, with partners now. We require that they follow GSE and federal guidelines on these matters, and they all and we only work with people that have good um, best practices in uh, in these in these matters. Okay, so you're going to be offering loan modifications. People don't have to, uh, you know, not know about them. You will be offering them. Is that right? We will be ensuring that our partners provide that. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Monahan. Uh, Chair uh, Chair Foreman Waters, we have already modified a bunch of these loans, and the good news is uh, a lot of them also have paid off uh, through normal things. A lot of them come current, so yes, we'll continue to modify them. Because as Mr. Diamond said, the last thing we like to do is to take someone who can pay us uh, 
Thank you for closure. Okay, thank you. I don't have time to continue on that line of questioning because I want to talk about uh, not only the fact that the cost of housing is just escalating so much in my own state of California, you know it's increased probably about 20%. And so it's very difficult uh, for people to be able to get these down payments, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to ask you about these low cost housing, uh, housing uh, that's under $100,000 in some of these areas all across the country, small towns and communities of color in particular. They can't get loans from your banks, uh, they tell me. I ask you to su submit some information on that. Most of you did, but how many of you uh, are absolutely committed uh, to taking a look at this market and understanding that this is a way by which people in low cost housing can become owners if in fact they can get the loans from you. I'll go back to Mr. Diamond again. Uh, you raised a very good point with us a couple of days ago and we are gonna dig deep into it and see if we can come with programs that work. Ms. Frazier? Exactly the same, Chairwoman Waters. Okay. Um, Monahan. Uh, Chair, Chairwoman Waters, yes, we are going to take a look at it. You raised a good point. And uh, as we enter some markets with lower cost housing, we probably will be doing more of them anyway. Mr. Sheriff. Chairwoman Waters, we do a significant amount of loans under 100,000. We will absolutely look to see if we can do more. Okay. And I suppose Gorman. It's not really a business, Chairman Waters, that we're in. We only did seven loans this year of that size. Okay. All right, thank you. My time has expired, and I can't get into this any deeper, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time, and I will now call on our ranking member. Uh, you have five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I want to thank uh, you all for being here in this in this format. Um, uh, and as I open, this is a this is a this is a sequel that no one asked for. Uh, the hearing two years ago, I don't know that much was learned. Uh, we, we're going to have a similar issue set, but modified by the political uh, discourse of the day. Um, but, um, and so, you know, I, I think of this as an as a opportunity for me to ask you important questions about your insight into the economy. We know that through the financial crisis, um, uh, the banking sector and uh, it provided important liquidity and, and uh, played its role in our economy to ensure that um, uh, that lending was possible, uh, that smart underwriting and lending was still possible in the midst of a pandemic. So I, I think that is uh, commendable work that uh, your institutions and uh, uh, banks and fintechs and credit unions put in uh, during the financial crisis. Um, the question I have for the whole panel is to is to have the outlook on jobs going forward. Uh, we had 8 million unfilled jobs uh, last month, uh, 8 million unfilled jobs. We had 266,000, uh, 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 you know, uh, net increase um, in employment, um, uh, but 8 million jobs unfilled. There's a lot of debate in Washington about why that's happening. I'd like to hear from you as experts on the economy uh, about the nature of that. So if we can begin with uh, you, Mr. Scharf, and then uh, you, Mr. Moynihan. Congressman, I'm not sure I have a great answer uh, as, as to why it's the case. What I can uh, tell you is what we hear from our clients and what we see ourselves. And what we see from our clients uh, is that their confidence is building um, and they uh, feel very, very good about the prospects for the second half of the year. Uh, debt levels are down uh, for on a corporate but, basis. But how can you have economic growth if you can't get people to go back to work? That That's the fundamental question. Let me move on to you, Mr. Moynihan. Same question. Our small business customers, we just completed a survey in that the issue raised has come up to the highest level of all the issues. It was a pandemic, obviously, six months ago, and now it's turned to uh, getting workers for the jobs. I think it's a serious concern, and I think that the states and Others I talked to are trying to put money to work to train people, and I, I agree with you. It's if you think forward about the risk of the economy, it's the it's the inability to get stuff in through the ports, and it's the ability to get uh, people to work uh, back to work in a uh, fashion now that the economy is opening up. Uh, Miss Miss Fraser and uh, Mr. Diamond, 
Yes, I think we're seeing significant dislocations as the economy normalizes. One of the pieces that will be critical is as the savings go back to work and as liquidity that is sitting out there at the moment gets translated into ways that create more, more employment and new business creation um, to drive the, the recovery. I think, uh, Ranking member, I think the uh, reasons are many fold, including you know, some of the unemployment insurance, including the fact that our schools haven't reopened up, and including the fact that people actually have a lot of money and they don't particularly feel like going back to work. But I would, I think you should rest assured, I think we're going to see a completely booming economy, a lot of people are going back to work, and hopefully it will continue for quite a while. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for answering that. Uh, now I've got uh, questions about on the international front. We see uh, uh, a lack of transparency so associated with China's lending across the globe. Uh, China's resisted international standards set by bodies such as the Paris Club and the OECD arrangement on officially supported export credits. Uh, we see this globally. Moreover, we see the Federal Reserve has flagged elevated debt levels in China, high real estate valuations and weaknesses in their financial sector. And what I see is a, a lack of transparency in their in their lending and a lack of transparency internationally uh, to their domestic uh, actions. Um, can you give me further insight into this and how can, um, uh, you know, how should we believe uh, China? Um, and do you believe that China's lack of transparency and its, and its official financial sector vulnerabilities pose a potential risk to global financial stability. Uh, Mr. Solomon, that question is for you. Uh, then to you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, I, I appreciate the question, Ranking Member McHenry, and, uh, and I think you, you phrased a bunch of issues um, that are issues that we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about. Uh, transparency in markets is always extremely important, uh, and more transparency is better. I think that we understand that we operate in a very globally interconnected market, so the degree that some of the issues you highlight do become issues that have an impact on China's economic, economic activity, we'll certainly feel it back here in the United States and can have a contagion effect. I don't see that at the moment as, as a likely issue, given the recovery they've had coming out of their pandemic, but I think all these things are things that should be watched and observed closely. The gentleman's well, time time, I think time. you were saved by the bell, and uh, thank you all for testifying. The gentlewoman from New York, Mrs. Maloney, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, for holding this hearing and standing up for consumers. And thank you to the panel for participating. I, I want to follow up on the questions from Senator Warren about overdraft fees. Uh, uh, President Obama signed into law my credit card act, a bill I wrote to end the most abusive practices of the credit card industry. According to one study, this, this bill alone is estimated to have saved consumers nearly $12 billion a year. A, a 2015 CFPB study estimated that it saved consumers $16 billion in the first years of its enactment. But where we made great progress on stopping abusive practices in the credit card market, there is still much work to do on banks' overdraft practices. I plan to soon reintroduce my legislation, the Overdraft Protection Act, to crack down on unfair predatory overdraft fees. Bank overdraft fees are outrageously priced, predatory, and beyond the scale of what a reasonable charge should be for this service. And we know that these fees and practices are harming consumers and taking billions out of their pockets. According to an S&P Global Market article from earlier this year, uh, the larger banks collected $8.8 .8 billion in overdraft fees alone and reported over $147 billion in net income in 2020. Making these practices even more egregious, overdraft fees hit those who can afford them the least, the hardest. Those who are trapped are often cash-strapped, hardworking Americans and college students who are struggling to pay their bills. And so that $8.8 .8 billion collected last year is money taken out of the hands of Americans who are trying to just keep food on the table and stay afloat in the middle of our pandemic. Each bank has slightly different policies, making this even more confusing to consumers. 
all of your banks basically charge around $35 for each overdraft. But the worst of these fees can be on debit card transactions, where the overdraft averages $20 but comes with a $35 fee. Multiple transactions can quickly add up to where consumers charge well over $100 in fees alone. So let's uh, focus on Wells Fargo. Mr. Sheriff, neither City nor Bank of America charge overdraft fees on debit card transactions, apparently deciding this practice was not in the best interest of their customers. I, I find it curious, why has your bank made the opposite decision, seemingly thinking a, a sandwich or a cup of coffee at a deli should result in a $35 overdraft fee if they can uh, afford it? I'm sorry, are you finished? I'm waiting for your answer. Congresswoman, we are constantly looking at ways to be more consumer friendly. We introduced an account last year, which has no overdraft fees uh, at, at all. Uh, it's actually one of probably our most popular accounts since we've introduced it. And so we have options uh, that are readily available for customers uh, who do not want to overdraft. Uh, we also offer overdraft protection and something called overdraft rewind for those that aren't account that can overdraft, uh, which allows us to look back 24 hours for a direct deposit coming into that account. And so these are things that we've added where we're looking to become uh, more consumer friendly, uh, but it's certainly something that you know we will continue to look at. Well, when did you introduce your, there? you have a, an account that has no overdraft fees? We introduced I would it. think that everybody would take that one because I don't think many people want to pay $35 uh, overdraft fee for a cup, cup of coffee. When did you introduce the program that has no overdraft fees? We announced it approximately a year ago, and I believe we've had it in the market for probably six months or so. I'll get you the specific dates. And, uh, so, and how, do you, uh, how do you inform your customers that they can have this option of not having any overdraft fees. It is, it's part of the suite of products that we talk to our customers about on a very regular basis. Well, it, it seems like uh, I would think everyone would, would cho choose that if that was a really uh, uh, possible. I, I think uh, everyone likes a good sandwich and a cup of coffee, but not at a cost of 40 or $50. Uh, and uh, I feel that these uh, uh, fees are unfair unaffordable and unreasonable for all Americans, plain and simple. Um, let, let me ask you, Mr. Sheriff, do you think a $35 fee for a $6 debit charge is reasonable? The gentle latest time has expired. Would you please uh, get back to Ms. Maloney to answer that question? With that, we're going to go on to Ms. Wagner from Missouri. You recognize uh, yes, for five you. minutes. I thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I'd like to also thank our witnesses for being with us today. It is important to me that public companies, such as the ones that you all lead, continue to focus less on political agendas and more on what will benefit your investors, your customers, and your workers the most. That is maximizing profits and shareholder value. I just like to say that up front. Mr. Moynihan and Mr. Diamond, this is for you. The Biden administration has proposed an increase in the tax rate as high as 28% for American businesses and industry along with many other tax increase measures, all to offset an additional anywhere from 1.7 to $2.3 trillion in government spending. How would an increased rate impact your ability to support our economic recovery? And what sort of burden would American workers and small businesses bear? I'll start with uh, Mr. Moynihan's response first. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think starting with your point about what our customers tell us, uh, our small and medium-sized businesses, of which we have many, you know, are worried about tax increases. Uh, 
not uh, slowing down their ability to invest in their employees, invest in new equipment, be competitive, because many of those small businesses supply into the supply chain for the larger companies in this country. And so their concern is about that. When you go to the larger companies and increase in taxes is a couple things. One is it, it their fear is that it'll lead them to have to put more capital available outside the United States because because frankly, the final demand, the globalization economy provides opportunities that weren't here 30 years ago. And I think they're concerned about that. They're also concerned about the impact of prices coming into them from suppliers. So, you know, I think that's what's on the minds of our customers. And, and I know that you there's a lot of work going on in this body and other bodies regarding the merits of all that, but that's what we're here for. Thank you. Customers. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mr. Diamond, briefly. Yeah, so the, uh, you know, the Biden tax number has taxes going from 21% to 28% which is halfway back to what we think we had uh, in 2017 before the last tax act of 35. But the tax increase is actually four times what the tax decrease was from 2017. Because you all know the right. phrase, devil the details. Well, the details here are all that matter, not the top line of 28%. I've always believed that we need, if you want to have a healthy, growing, competitive America against the rest of the world, you need a global competitive tax rate because at the margin, capital be retained and invested overseas, the same cap you want retained and invested over here. So I think it would be detrimental to a lot of, I'm not worried about banks per se, it will be detrimental to a lot of companies, it will push a lot of capital overseas, it'll be unfortunate. Uh, there are better ways to collect taxes that would do less than that. And it would hurt uh, the, the customers and the clients that you serve uh, every single day. And That's you right. must also remember that 55% uh, uh, of small businesses organized as a C-Corp. So real quickly, one answer fast. Uh, would an increased rate allow your firms to be more or less competitive globally? Mr. Moynihan, more or less competitive? I'm sorry, an increased rate uh, could lead to less competitiveness globally. Mr. Diamond. It would be less competitive and they'll get increasingly worse over time. Thank you. Mr. Diamond um, and Ms. Frazier. Would you describe the challenges your firm faces in terms of global competition? Specifically, how does China factor into those challenges as a global competitor? I'll start uh, with Ms. Frazier's response, please. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the um, chi you know, China is playing an increasing role in the global financial system. Um, and uh, I think it's very important that for serving American multinationals abroad and indeed the U.S. government uh, and other entities that um, that the important flows of foreign exchange, trade, cash management, um, and indeed the access of global investors, the US market happens on American rails um, and not on um, another country's. I think it's a strate of strategic importance um, for our multinational companies and, and those working abroad. Um, Mr. Solomon and Mr. Gorman, discussions around a financial tax transaction tax have increased over the last several months. I'm concerned about the harm that this tax would do to our Main Street investors saving for college or retirement. Um, what adverse effects would this type of tax create within our financial system? Mr. Solomon, and I have very limited time. It, it impacts investors and it would impact investor activities, uh, Congresswoman. I, I, if I could, Madam Chairman, I'm run out of time. I would um, uh, ask for Mr. Solomon and Mr. Gorman to send me a written response if they uh, wouldn't mind to the concept of this financial tra uh, transaction tax. And I thank you and I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Velasquez, who is also the chair of the House Committee on Small Businesses now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Mr. Diamond, I would like to address my first question to you. In addition to being a senior member of this committee, as mentioned by the chair, I am also the chair of the House Small Business Committee, which has primary jurisdiction over the Paycheck Protection Program. Despite making several changes to the program between the first tranche and the second tranche, to make it easier for LMI small businesses to access funding and including a specific set aside for borrowers located in LMI areas. 
the number of PPP loans issued by JP Morgan community uh, in LMI communities actually decreased. In round one, your bank issued approximately 58,000 loans to LMI at small businesses, while in round two, you only issue appro approximately 14,000. Can you explain this decrease? Well, we, we are we're the largest lender in PPP. Uh, we lent as much as we can everywhere we can according to government guidelines. 90% of the loans in the first round went to companies of uh, less than uh, 20 employees. And we reached out everywhere to LMI communities and stuff like that. I'll get the exact numbers, but I think we did a fairly good job at it. And well, I, I do have the numbers. I do have yeah, the well, numbers. I do have the data because I'm the chair of the Small Business Committee and uh, working with the SBA. In fact, we held a hearing yesterday. So my question to you is, when we are talking here, that despite the fact that we um, put aside, a set aside for just um, lending to LMI small businesses, uh, the, not only do you your bank decreased the number compared to first uh, the first tranche and the second tranche, but also the size of those loans. In, it went down from approximately 117,000 in round one to 80,000 in round two. At the exact, exact time, uh, we all knew that small businesses in LMI community were starving for capital. And despite how hard they work at applying for those loans. So it doesn't seem to me that your bank was doing everything it could uh, to reach these businesses. Well, we did, and we reached out everywhere we can. There was less demand. The second program was smaller, and then we, we then we went out in other ways too. We we lent seventy million dollars. We gave invested seventy million dollars in MDIs. We invested in some of the Latinx banks. Uh, we reached out to CDFIs. We begged them to help us find more people. So we did everything we can reasonably can we, we can reasonably do, and we always try to do the best we can. Well, sir, uh, the numbers showed otherwise, and. Those numbers change in LMI communities when we work and brought in mission-based lenders such as CDFI, CDCs, micro lenders. So um, I hope that uh, we can do a better job in reaching out to those businesses that um, are starving to get access to capital. Ms. Fraser, uh, when we held this hearing two years ago, I questioned your predecessor on Citigroup's uh, CEO pay rate, uh, ratio, which was the largest of any bank testifying that day, a remarkable 486 uh, to one ratio. Can you explain how you're working to reduce this ratio? And in your explanation, can you discuss not only the CEO side of the equation, but the median employee compensation side as well? Ms. Fraser? Can you hear Jane? Sorry, my apologies. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, yes, I, um, I want to start by saying we completely appreciate um, how fortunate I am for the compensation that I do get um, as the new CEO at City. We want to make sure that our employees have a fairer competitive wage, they have the opportunity to grow inside our company, provide them development opportunities, and also to provide them the different benefits that they need to support their families um, and um, you know, for, for all the challenges during COVID and beyond. So the different met, um, things that we're looking at are the programs that we can put in place to support our employees' growth in their compensation going forward. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. The gentle lady's time has expired. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <laughs> as the largest financial institutions in the country, you extended $8.3 trillion in credit last year, um, which is a testament to your ability to advance our economy. I'm very thankful for that, quite frankly. 
However, when you all decide to boycott industries, you use your, shop, uh, your size and power to put companies out of business. What's worse is that these decisions clearly are not made as a matter of conscience. Your investments in China prove that. These decisions are being made to pacify political activists who want to do what the law cannot do, which is shut down legal American businesses. By complying, you are no longer supporting our economy, but actively working against it, I would argue. Uh, to that end, <clears throat> um, the, uh, there's a report uh, out that all of you have uh, put out, the Environmental, Social, and Governance Report, where you publicly claim the actions of your banks in these different areas. Five of the six reports that your institution specifically mentioned moving away from coal financing and investing in other things. There's an article just recently came, that came out in Bloomberg titled Goldman City Lead U.S. Banks Plowing Billions into China, uh, specifically JP and City 21 billion, Goldman 17 billion, B of A 13, Morgan Stanley and Wells Fargo 4. Um, to that end, it's worth noting that the ESG reports condemning the coal industry, only Goldman mentioned China in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, Ms. Frazier, a uh, quick question for you. Is coal and Drilling for oil and gas, is that illegal? No, it's not no. illegal. Um, are you taking similar actions in China to what you're doing here in the United States by boycotting specific industries and putting pressure on companies to change their business model? Um, we are supporting the clients that we serve, multinationals and, uh, and local companies, um, to uh, make the transition to lower carbon technologies, mindful that different industries are at different stages of doing so. So you're probably not, is that what you're telling me? Correct. Okay, we, Mr. Foreman, um, Morgan Stanley, they've got about four billion. Um, same question, is mining uh, coal and drilling for oil and gas, is that illegal? No, it's not. Um, are you, you know, taking similar action in China that you're doing here with boycotting specific industries and putting pressure on companies to change their business model? We're continuing to support coal, uh, existing coal businesses around the world. We're not financing new coal businesses in any country in the world. It all goes to our franchise committee. Thank you for that. Um, in addition to the ESG reports, each of your institutions have published statements on human rights that which include actions your companies are taking to improve human rights around the globe. Um, I want to point out that not one of your statements on human rights mentioned China. Not one single company mentioned China in your human rights statement. The State Department has a statement now with regards to what's going on in China. It's, it's widely reported that the kind of uh, religious uh, genocide that's going on, the horrible torture and other things that are going on with uh, minority religious groups over there. And now even the administration in the last couple of days has acknowledged that the, the development of the COVID, vac, uh, COVID virus at Wuhan Labs is going to go after that, which is done obviously for nefarious purposes. Uh, Mr. Solomon, you've been in China since 1994, have a 17 billion investments there. Um, do you intend to alter your business in China as a result of these human rights violations? Uh, we, uh, well, first and foremost, uh, Congressman, I appreciate the question. And first and foremost, we're an American company, but we operate on a global basis. Uh, I think the bilateral relationship between the U.S. and China is incredibly complex. There are places where obviously we cooperate, and there are places where we're confrontational. We try to navigate that in an appropriate way and stay engaged with our clients around the globe. So is the lure of profits that great that you will turn your eye to the human tragedies and sufferings that are going on in China by their government and, and the Communist Party, which is one and the same, which is who you deal with for the last uh, almost uh, 30 years here? We, uh, we, we, I think, look at this broadly as a complex relationship. I saw recently that Secretary of State Blinken said that we have to at all times be competitive, collaborative and adversarial. We try to operate our clients, our U.S. companies that we serve, congressmen are operating in China, and we try to serve them in that context. We think it's better to stay engaged than not, but we'll follow very closely what you all do as legislators in terms of how U.S. companies should be engaged around the world, and we take that very seriously. Mr. Diamond, would you like to answer the same question? Do you intend to alter your business in China because of these human atrocities that's going on? So uh, we, we operate in over 100 countries and we operate under the law of the land in each of those countries and under the law, the law of the land is the party law? No, but, but, no but, but we follow the foreign policy of the United States of America, which is your policy. So we follow engagement, 
foreign policy in this country and were you and were you tell us to get out of China and when you tell us not to we don't like Cuba uh, uh, how we do business in Russia, we follow exactly what you tell us to do because we're patriots just like the rest of you in this uh, call. Well, I think the previous administration is getting out of China, cutting trade ties and, and, and getting the trade deficit down. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Investor Protection, Entrepreneurship and Capital Markets, is now recognized for five minutes. In 2008, the financial system caused a horrendous crisis that devastated our country. Democrats responded by changing the regulatory system, particularly Dodd-Frank. Now the financial system has survived uh, the greatest stress test that I could have imagined. It did not cause this crisis and it has shown resiliency during this crisis. That's in part because of the regulatory changes that we made, and in part because of the stewardship of some of the executives uh, that are before us today. Um, we now face a, another systemic uh, crisis uh, that is uh, certainly not at the same level of COVID, and that is LIBOR. Um, we can solve this in advance and avoid the problem. My colleagues have heard me talk about this again and again. We have several trillion dollars of instruments outstanding where next year uh, or, or in the following year, you will not be able to calculate the amount of interest that is due because they're tied to the LIBOR rate that the uh, folks in London will no longer uh, publish. So I'll ask each of you, uh, and I'm going to ask you to answer in one word. Do you feel that federal legislation is warranted? Uh, to deal with the financial and legal fallout that will occur if we uh, uh, don't have a replacement rate for LIBOR. Mr. Diamond. Yes. And, uh, Ms. Frazier. Absolutely, yes. Mr. Gorman. Yes. Mr. Uh, Moynihan. Yes. Mr. Scharf. Yes. Mr. Solomon. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Solomon, uh, Archegos put a light on uh, total default swaps in family offices. We haven't had in this country a limitation on margin lending. You uh, have to put up half the money, uh, and that has been the rule basically my entire long lifetime. But we saw the Archegos uh, family office get nine to one leverage by using the uh, total return swap. And so my question is, um, should we allow the average Robinhood investor to get nine to one leverage? Uh, should we prevent uh, Archegos and the other well-connected and wealthy institutions from getting more than one-to-one -one leverage by banning the total return swap and similar devices? Or should we have one rule for Robin Hood and another rule for the Sheriff of Nottingham and his family office? So I appreciate the, uh, the question, Congressman. And I think that, that this is an area that I know people are looking at closely. And I think, um, I think it's, it's probably a good thing to, complete, to, to continue to look at it. I think the big thing I'd focus on is transparency. And I think one of the things that would be interesting is to update the disclosure regime around the different more modern ownership Mr. exposure. Solomon, I, I asked a question. I don't, it's now very transparent. If you're a Robin Hood customer, you get one-to-one -one leverage. If you can negotiate a total default swap because you're big, you can get eight-to-one, nine-to-one leverage. That's transparent. The question I asked you is, should we stop it? And your response has been, well, we should disclose it. My question is, should we have the same rule for Robin Hood as the Sheriff of Nottingham in his family office? I think when you look at institutional participants in markets, there are a variety of ways where people can get leverage that's more than one to one. Generally for just straight stock ownership, straight up cash stock ownership, whether retail or institutional, um, if you're looking at straight margin, reg T margin rules, it is one to one. Generally speaking, uh, obviously, the total, it, it, reclaiming my time, the total the swap swap is a way to have all the economic benefits of stock ownership and evade the rules 
I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question uh, for uh, Mr. Sharp, and that is, uh, we see that a trillion dollars of federal taxes go unpaid by the top 1%. Uh, Secretary Biden, has, uh, correct, President Biden has uh, indicated, uh, along with his uh, Treasury Secretary, that to collect that, we need more reports uh, from banks. If those are legally required, are you prepared to cooperate uh, and uh, uh, not only disclosing the taxable income, but the transactions uh, required? Congressman, we'll, we, will, we will do whatever is legally required. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Forty years ago, as a young man, I was trying to get into the farming business, and I went through the inflationary period in the late 70s and early 80s. Very exposed, operating in debt, interest rate controls had gone off. It was a wild ride. So that brings me to where we are 40 years later. Over the past several months, we've experienced a surge in commodity prices, crude oil, natural gas, corn, soybeans, wheat, materials like lumber and cotton. What uh, do you believe has been driving this rise in prices, and do you expect this to be sustained for some time to come? And I'd first like to turn to Mr. Solomon and Mr. Gorman uh, to weigh on this, if you would please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I appreciate the question. It's certainly something that we've been spending a meaningful amount of time thinking about. I think there are a number of factors that have been affecting commodity prices. And I think as you stand back and look, the shutdown of the pandemic uh, and the dramatic contraction of the economy had a profound contracting effect. And now we're opening up very quickly. And so we have the combination of demand picking up very quickly and supply production and availability and supply chains and distribution chains not being as full as they would normally be. That's obviously leading to inflation and in prices. I think what's hard to see at this point is whether or not it's going to be transitory or whether or not it will, it will continue or be more sustained. Uh, I do think it's something to watch very carefully. And the, the speed of the recovery, the recovery combined with other fiscal actions or monetary actions we take will obviously have an impact on this. Hopefully the Fed can manage appropriately as we go forward in what's obviously going to be a strong economic pickup from a demand perspective. Mr. Solomon. Uh, Representative Lucas, um, thank you also for the question. And coming from a long line of farmers from uh, the outback in Australia where wheat and sheep were uh, the family product, uh, a lot of sympathy for the space. Uh, commodity prices are, are simply a function of supply and demand. We've had interrupted supply. Uh, we've had a global recession and now we're getting extraordinary demand. We've never had this kind of global synchronized growth that we're going through now. So you're going you're gonna to see surges in prices. Um, but as more capacity is brought online, whether it's oil rigs or uh, more mining around the world, you, you know, these things rebalance. But right now we're in a surge. I'm just a little nervous, having increased the national debt from, what, 20 trillion a year and a half ago to 28 trillion. That seems like a rather expansive increase in the monetary supply. And as the economy picks up and what's the term, velocity of circulation increases, I'm just nervous. Anyone under 60 did not live through that period when Mr. Volker decided to bring it out of the economy, it almost wrung a lot of us out of existence. That said, uh, second question, uh, as Congresswoman Wagner discussed, the Biden administration has proposed more than $4 trillion in spending for the American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan, of which the administration plans to finance with a hike in corporate uh, and individual taxes. The administration's also proposed a global minimum corporate uh, tax rate. Uh, while we should level the playing field for U.S. businesses, some argue that global minimal corporate tax rates would be disadvantageous to U.S. companies. Mr. Diamond, could you comment on this concern and how feasible this proposal would be to actually achieve a global tax rate? Yeah, so America would be the only country, I think, in the wor world that would have what you would call a global tax rate. I pointed out earlier that going from 21 to 28 isn't the issue because people say it's halfway back to what the tax cuts were, but the tax increase because of something like that is actually four times the tax cut of 2017. There's no question in my mind that at the margin, not for every decision made, but at the margin that will drive capital and eventually brains and R&D and investment overseas and that that would be a mistake for America. Ms. Frazier, could you share your thoughts on how feasible a global minimum corporate tax rate is? 
Um, I think it's very hard to get other countries to sign on to an equivalent program, um, um, despite some optimism of doing so. I think that that will be extremely difficult, uh, and therefore it could put the US in a position of being uh, less competitive uh, around the world. Um, My background representing an agriculture and an industry, uh, energy industry kind of a district, those international markets are critically important for us, and we've gone through trade wars beyond belief for the last 50 years trying to have fair access and be able to compete. I'm just very sensitive about undoing the progress we've made, just as I'm very sensitive about setting off a, a Carter error, kind of an inflation wave too. Thank you for your comments uh, and yield back the balance of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks, who's also the chair of the House Committee on, Financial, on uh, Foreign Affairs, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for having this important hearing. You know, institutional investors are monitoring uh, racial and equity commitments. For example, BlackRock announced in April that they pledged to conduct a racial equity audit to integrate equity and inclusion into all aspects of their business model. Additionally, here in New York, New York State Comptroller announced in February that the state's retirement fund will submit shareholder proposals on conducting racial equity audits, including calling upon Amazon to conduct such a, uh, an audit. However, many of you seem to disagree with this idea. So let me ask, Mr. Diner, uh, first, uh, your J.P. Morgan's uh, proxy statement states that, and I quote, conducting a racial equity audit would not provide us with useful additional information. And Ms. Frazier, Similarly, uh, uh, we've heard that the bank recently urged its shareholders to vote against a similar proposal. So could both Mr. Diamond and Ms. Frazier, could you elaborate on your opposition to independent racial equity audits? Yeah, so I'll start. And um, you, know, you know we're devoted to the principle of trying to do a better job for the Black and Latinx community. We've announced an extraordinary amount of programs that you're welcome to come and look at. And we, you know, from community branches, I just visited one in Harlem uh, to $30 billion for affordable housing and mortgages for black folks, for small business enterprise, for getting kids through high school. It's pretty extraordinary, it's pretty global. And I think a lot of the other companies do it too. We're doubling down after the murder of George Floyd. So the company's completely devoted and we report it out. That is completely different than the bureaucracy and BS of having outside orders come in to certify something. I'd rather take our time and our effort, put it in the effort. If there are best practices that we can learn from, we'll learn from them. But this kind of thing is not gonna make it much better over time. It just adds another whole layer of, uh, of unnecessary cost. Um, and from the city end, you know, we feel we have been very transparent. Uh, we just put out uh, another very extensive update on our billion dollar action for racial equity plan. You know, that covers all different dimensions um, of the bank's activities, both inside the bank and outside, many of which are, are verified by third parties. So we didn't think it was uh, it was needed to have a separate audit, uh, but it is something that we're looking at again, uh, given it was brought up by our shareholders. Yeah, I think it's something in reply to Mr. Diamond, you say it's not, unless you can verify something with an independent audit. I mean, we've seen, I've seen in my time here, for example, uh, internal audits, like that's what happened with Exxon. Something that wasn't verifiable, you put in, you get the figures that you want. But if you're having someone come in independently to verify what's going on, then it is something that is trustworthy, not something that may be just in favor of, uh, of, of a particular company or, or financial institution. So I think that independent, and that's why independent audits for various institutions are always important, uh, just as an independent audit on whether or not uh, these commitments are lived up to. But I have just a minute. Let me go uh, to also to ask, you know, I'm pleased to hear that many of you have committed significant capital investments towards minority dis depository institutions. And uh, I've really been encouraging such investments over the past few years, along with Mr. Green and, Ms. and Chairman Waters, uh, uh, and a number of other members on this committee. Um, and I would love to hear more about the implementation because a commitment to invest is very different from an agreement to invest. And I'll be asking all of you for written responses to this question. But in the meantime, Mr. Schaff and Mr. Monaghan, 
Can you let this committee know whether or not your public commitments to invest in NDIs has or will result in direct agreements with these institutions? Start with Mr. Shaft. Congressman, we've, uh, we have agreements with uh, 13 uh, black owned minority deposit institutions uh, representing $15 million um, of equity commitments. And that's separate from the commitments that we've made to uh, the CDFIs, where we've committed another $250 million and we've already given out $150 million of that 250. Mr. Monaghan? Uh, uh, Congressman Meeks, we have completed and the money is in common equity for 17 institutions to date, up to 5% based on what they wanted. We've made offer, offers to the other 120 or so that are out there to similarly look at uh, investing in them. Many don't need the money um, and told us they don't want the equity. So we've gone literally institution by institution to make the investments. I'm out of time. Are you back, Madam Chair? Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinger, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And to all the participants, I uh, intend to touch on a few issues, but also that my uh, previous uh, colleagues have, have touched on, but I want to go explore some other things. And uh, to Ms. Frazier, um, congratulations uh, and welcome to the frying pan. Uh, so, um, I want to talk a little bit, and I'd like to hear very quickly from each one of you. What do you see as the greatest threat to our financial system right now and, 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 to, your, uh, and to your company as well? Uh, Mr. Moynihan. Well, uh, as a financial institution, the number one question is what's the economy going to do? Because the economy? Know, okay. Uh, All right. I, I need it really brief. Uh, Ms. Frazier. Uh, cyber security, cyber. given how much of the private infrastructure sits in or the infrastructure sits in private hands. Okay. How about Mr. Solomon? Uh, I'd highlight three things we've focused on, cyber, central clearing risk, growing government debt around the world. Okay, Mr. Diamond. Uh, public policy not being properly executed in the United States of America, which means we may not be able to take a leadership role in the world for the rest of our lives. Uh, okay, <laughs> what does that mean exactly? I think we've done public policy not particularly well when it because of infrastructure, immigration, health care, Taxation, regulation, we've stifled the okay. formation of small business. American leadership really matters. If we don't get our economic act together, okay. we won't be a leader in 20 years. Okay. Um, Mr. Gorman? Uh, narrow uh, cyber and specifically the potential impact on uh, consumer data and data privacy. Mr. Sharp? Uh, cyber. Okay. Um, so I, I, to, uh, to paraphrase my friend, uh, Mr. Perlmutter in his opening, uh, what his, one of his goals is basically to have safe and sound lending and banking for everyone. I wholeheartedly agree. Um, now, what's interesting to me though, is only Mr. Diamond came close to talking about uh, sort of the social issues side of things. Um, yet all of you have uh, indicated that by 2050, uh, you intend to be at a, at a, uh, uh, a zero emission uh, scheme within your within your banking system, uh, Mr. Solomon. I, I guess you've outdone everybody by saying 2025. Um, and I, I'm curious. I didn't hear climate in any of that. Closest again was Mr. Diamond. But why the hell? Excuse me. Why are you spending so much time and effort into this? And Mr. Diamond, you were just expressing why you felt frustrated that you would have to be going through formal audits of these things. Um, because it's not necessarily productive. And I, I'm very concerned about the pressure that, uh, that you all are receiving as, uh, as CEOs and as an organization. Um, by the way, I, I'm curious, I would like to hear from everybody very quickly whether you're banking in Taiwan or not, or are you gonna John Cena yourselves in this? So I, if, if, if anybody isn't banking in Taiwan, I'd love to hear you. Any clients that are not in Taiwan? Everyone else is in Taiwan, or you do not have any clients in Taiwan? Congressman, it's Wells Fargo. I don't know the answer to the question, but we can get back okay. to you. Tell you what, I, let's uh, let's reserve that. I'd like to hear back from everybody because I think that is uh, that is another pressure point, as one of my other colleagues, uh, Mr. Luke Meyer, was talking about. But it, here, you know, all of your all of your uh, all of your firms have have pledged fidelity to this whole notion of 
of uh, of bowing to uh, to the wokeness uh, that's going on, on on environment. And I'm curious, and Madam Chair, I'd like to submit for the record a letter uh, that is from 15 different state treasurers, uh, led by the uh, West Virginia State Treasurer, uh, to uh, uh, former Senator Kerry, uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, the special envoy now, uh, indicating that they are going to be coming back to you, their financial institutions, who they do over $600 billion worth of business. Now, I know in DC, we're spending trillions like it's, like it's you know, Friday night poker money, uh, but uh, $600 billion is a significant amount of business for everybody. And I'm curious uh, from everybody, have you seen this letter? And what is your response to that? And basically they're saying, if you are going to uh, limit our ability to uh, have companies in our states, in energy sector, in oil, gas, coal, uh, we're not going to do business with you. Are you aware of this this letter? And what's your reaction, Mr. Diamond? You're first on my on my screen. No, we we've uh, well, we think that climate's a serious issue. I understand. Are you issue. aware of the letter? Yes. Okay. Is anybody unaware of the letter? I have not seen the letter. Okay. I have not seen the letter either. All right, we'll we'll ship it over. We'll make sure that uh, that you get that. I know my time is up. I do want to hear about LIBOR and SOFR as well, and uh, I will uh, submit some questions in writing on, uh, on LIBOR and whether SOFR is the answer uh, for this problem. And I yield back. Gentlemen's time is expired, and your letter is submitted without objection. Thank you. We'll move on. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott who is also the chair of the House Agricultural Committee, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Lady, and I am so excited <laughs> to be on this uh, panel at this time because we have a major issue here. I want to talk about our unbanked, underbanked, um, as we apply that to the child tax credit that has been in this because we have an excellent opportunity here with you all who are the leaders, Mr. Jamie Diamond, Ms. Frazier, Mr. Monahan, Mr. David Sullivan, Mr. Scharf, and Mr. Gorman. You all represent our largest banks. And I want to put this to you. We've, we've just passed the child credit uh, expanded, the Child Tax Credit Act did, in the $199 trillion COVID relief package. Here's what it does, 3600 for children under six, 3000 for children under 17, and each of the, the parents are getting uh, guaranteed checks every month. But here's the problem. They cannot do this and receive it with direct payments. And that's what I am concerned about. To help us to make sure that their child tax credit payments can come by way of direct deposits. It's dangerous out there when they don't get it directly. These large series of money every month got to go to a payday lender or somebody on the check cashing service where they got to pay money. So we need to find out what we need to do about this. So uh, Ms. Sharp, let me talk with you because Wells Fargo has the largest number of branches. And uh, I also check with our Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And let me give you these statistics. 13.8% of black households are unbanked. 12.2% of Hispanic households are unbanked. But you know what it is for white households? It's less than 2.5%. So it seems to me, my bipartisan colleagues, Reverend Cleaver, myself, and uh, Congressman French Hill from Arkansas has got a bill moving. It's over in the Senate now for financial inclusion. Tell us if you can 
what we must do. 70% of our African Americans live in neighborhoods with no branch bank. So please, Mr. Reef, you may start. What are you all doing? What can we do? Is there something we can add to our financial inclusion bill? Reverend Cleaver, myself, and Mr. Frenchio from Arkansas, I'll be glad to work with you. Mr. Reef, you got the largest numbers of branch banking. What percentage of yours is in the black neighborhoods? Congressman, I, I share your concern on the issue and also the desire uh, to make changes. Uh, and we as an institution are committed to bringing about the change that's necessary to bring more of the individuals that you're talking about into the system. We've what just, would be that change? A move to put more branches available, reach out to community organizations, get these accounts established. It's I'm dangerous. I think it's I think it's a combination of uh, financial education. It's a combination of product design, and it's a com and and it's also about having the right kind of facilities and the right kind of partners outside of the big banks themselves to ensure uh, that what we're building is serving the needs of the community. Mr. De Diamond, what about you? <coughs> It's financial education. It's us doing a better job reaching out to the community. And like Charlie said, it's working with CDFIs and MDIs to, to improve that outreach. All right. What about you, um, Mr. Solomon? We, um, we have a very, very small consumer business. We have, we have no branches. But I do think at a high level, just commenting generally, the comments that Mr. Diamond and Mr. Scharf made are, are correct. Financial education using the network of CD, uh, CDFIs, mission-driven lenders, et cetera, for better reach out. Well, I hope y'all know we got to solve this problem. We can't leave these people. Many of them are single-headed household, people with disabilities, mm -hmm. with no bank accounts. They're out there, and the predators are waiting on them. We got to get their right time has expired. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is now recognized for five minutes. To our witnesses, thank you for your time today. Each of you or your predecessors signed the Business Roundtable's 2019 restatement of a purpose of a corporation, subordinating shareholders to so-called stakeholders. As yesterday's hearing in the Senate Banking Committee demonstrated, this redefinition of a corporate purpose did absolutely nothing to placate or appease Senator Warren or the extreme far left. In fact, it emboldened them. And whether you admit it or not, there are instances where the interests of shareholders and stakeholders come into conflict. For example, in October 2019, Senator Warren wrote a letter to Mr. Diamond stating that because of the restatement, she, quote, expects that you will endorse and wholeheartedly support her Accountable Capitalism Act. The bill would, among other things, require workers comprise 40 percent of the board and dictate that companies obtain a federal charter to operate. I'll ask each of you to answer yes or no, if you could. In an event where there is a direct conflict between the interest of shareholders and non-owner stakeholders, will you prioritize shareholder interests? Uh, Mr. Diamond, we'll start with you. Yes. Yep. Mr. Moynihan. As I said in my uh, open testimony, we deliver both for shareholders and for society. Which, When there's a conflict, which one will you prioritize? We will prioritize the return to the company. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Uh, yes, we'd prioritize shareholders. Ms. Frazier. Yes, we will prioritize our investors. Mr. Scharf. Yes, our shareholders. And Mr. Gorman. Uh, generally shareholders, there are circumstances where it's a no last year, we guaranteed every employee their job as stakeholders. That was obviously to the detriment of shareholders if we hadn't been profitable. Well, thanks for uh, mostly uh, keeping in mind your fiduciary duty to shareholders. Three of you uh, signed on to the Net Zero Banking Alliance, while three did not. The alliance is part of President Biden, John Kerry, and Bank of England, Mark Carney's misguided plan to weaponize the financial system and politicize it to choke off funding to legal fossil energy businesses. Joining the alliance requires your institutions to submit information 
to the United Nations so they can certify that you're green enough. Mr. Diamond, you did not sign this. Why not? Uh, it was too vague. It's hard to meet the commitments. We've already made a very detailed public statement about what we're going to try to accomplish. We've been working very closely with auto companies and oil companies and utilities to figure out how to do it the right way. We need to do this the right way, and science statements is not the right way. Over time, there will be better disclosure what people are trying to get done. I, I appreciate, as we discussed, your 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 commitment on, on this in your shareholder letter as well. Mr. Moynihan, Mr. Diamond says he doesn't need John Kerry, uh, Mark Carney, or environmentalists at the UN to tell him how to manage his risk or run his business. Um, my question to you is, should access to financial services be tied to the creditworthiness of borrowers, regardless of politics? Creditworthiness of borrowers is, is the primary way we underwrite credit, yes, sir. That's, that's, that's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, and I would encourage all of you to, to prioritize uh, credit, credit, credit risk as opposed to politics. Finally, on fossil energy, uh, does anyone on the panel think it's a good idea to immediately uh, and completely cut off financing to fossil energy? Uh, please raise your hand if you think it's a good idea to immediately cut off financing to fo for fossil. I want to let the record show that none of our panelists believe that that is the case. Uh, unfortunately, uh, some of your financing commitments combined with the administration's desire to, quote, change the allocation of capital and energy are disrupting supply without doing anything about demand. Data published even by the Biden administration concludes that fossil energy will constitute more than 70 percent of all energy consumption in the United States by 2050. Uh, this supply demand disruption will raise prices for consumers and see economic competitiveness to countries like China. Uh, in 2020, cities, JP Morgan, Goldman, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley had a combined $77.8 in exposure to China, up 10 percent from 2019. Um, and yet uh, uh, China is responsible for more than 27 percent of total global GHG emissions. Um, are any of you mandating the same environmental standards in your Chinese investments as you work with American companies to help them with the transition? Anyone can offer your opinion. Our, our standards are worldwide. Our standards are global too. Our standards are also global. Yeah. Ms. Frazier? It's a global policy, yes. It's the same. I, well, I, I'm running, running out of time, but I, I appreciate that approach. Uh, when, when China is uh, by far the leading emitter of global, uh, of global uh, GHG uh, greenhouse gases, it needs to be a uniform policy. If, if GSIBs are to promote American competitiveness, uh, let's hold China to the same standards we hold American companies. Thank you for your time and I yield back. Thank you. Um, the committee will be in recess for five minutes.
The committee will come to order. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, regardless as to what anyone says, you are bending the arc of the moral universe toward justice. <laughs> this hearing has been centuries in the making, and I'm proud that I'm here with you while you have the hands of justice making a difference in the lives of people. Thank you. I don't know of anybody else who would be doing this, Madam Chair. You are unique in all of history. Wow. Now, to my six friends, I have a question for you. If you find that your bank owns slaves or accepted slaves as collateral, would you publicly atone for this seminal sin? Mr. Solomon, a person of goodwill, would you publicly atone if you find that your bank owns slaves or accepted slaves as collateral? Yes or no, kindly, please, sir. Uh, the bank has never owned slaves, so I, I, I don't think it's something that, I, that I'm in a position to opine on. Well, let's just assume that you could be in error, sir. If you we find were established, that we were did. established, we were established you, in 1969, sir. We were established well, sometimes in 1969. things happen between in 18, excuse me, 18, We were established in 1869, and through our history, we have no, we had, no, we never owned slaves. We had no involvement with slavery. If you found that you did, would you atone? I, I'm not going to speculate on 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 something that's that's not that's not correct, sir. Quite regrettable, sir. Quite regrettable. Mrs. Scarf, Scarf, if you found that you owned them or had slaves as collateral, would you atone? Yes, Congressman. Thank you, sir. Mr. Monahan, if you found that you had slaves as collateral or your bank owned them, would you atone, sir? Yes, sir. Mr. Gorman, if you found that your bank owned slaves or had them as collateral, would you atone? Well, like Mr. Solomon, we were founded more recently, 1935, but yes, I would have told you. You would have told Thank you. You're, I, I, I appreciate it. Ms. Frazier, similar question to you. Frazier? I'm having some technical difficulties on my end. It may have something to do with the question, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Frazier? Again, I'm having technical difficulties. Listen, Madam Chair, I'm going to have to ask if you would give me an additional minute of time. Something is happening. I want to, I want to unmute. Uh, okay, Mr. Green, you're absolutely correct. Uh, there is some problem, and I don't know what it is at this point. I will ask the staff to try and find out what is going on. Would you attempt to stop? What is with his ass? Okay. Would you try to start again, Mr. Green? Yes, ma'am. And we will certainly make up for the time. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Frazier, I'm not you. Ms. Uh, Frazier, I've got to tell you that uh, I, I believe that some of the things that have been done on this committee are in part responsible for your occupying that seat. But be that as it may, Ms. Frazier, would you atone if you found that your bank owned or had slaves as collateral? We would absolutely accept responsibility, yes. We believe we never have. Thank you, ma'am. Now, Mr. Diamond, my dear friend, and I say that sincerely because of something that I know that you've done that was very positive. Uh, Mr. Diamond, at this hearing in 2019, you acknowledged that J.P. Morgan had accepted slaves as collateral, according to the bank's own analysis. But let's strike that. In addition, I would say Citizens Bank and Canal Bank in Louisiana, both now a part of J.P. Morgan, served plantations from the 1830s until the American Civil War. These banks sometimes took ownership of slaves 
when the plantation owners defaulted on loans. Between 1831 and 1865, two banks, these two banks accepted approximately 13,000 slaves as collateral and ended up owning about 1,250 slaves. Mr. Diamond, there can be no, there can be no redemption without recompense. Mr. Diamond, will you atone, will your bank atone for the ownership of human beings? Madam Chair, I cannot hear Mr. Diamond. I cannot hear him either. Would you try again, Mr. Diamond? You're muted, Mr. Diamond. Uh, Mr. Green? Yes, ma'am. We're going to try and work this out. Uh, staff, uh, can you help me to uh, find out what is happening? Uh, Mr. Diamond is indicating uh, that he is not muted, but we can't hear him. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. As well as I. Okay. I said that, uh, that the company did research and found out that companies have been bought many years earlier. In fact, it take collateral, uh, slaves as collateral and ownership in some cases. We apologize profusely at the time. And as you know, we're making extraordinary efforts to help lift up the black and the Latinx communities. Uh, Mr. Diamond, the question is, will you atone in the form of some sort of redemption for, so that you may receive redemption? Because there can be no redemption without some sort of recompense. <laughs> what will you do to atone for owning your banks, owning human beings? Uh, this is not about what you're doing. All of the other banks are doing these things that you're talking about now. We're talking about the ownership of human beings, Mr. Diamond. What are you going to do about this? And I want it directly linked to the ownership. You must say, Mr. Diamond, we own them. And here's what we're doing to take corrective action. Find those families. Find those families that are still with us. Atone. Will you I atone? Would love to, I, I would love to come see you and figure out what you think we could do that would atone properly to the families that were damaged by these activities uh, 200 years ago. So I'd be happy to do that. Um, I just Mr. can't make Diamond, it vague. I, I, I'm, I I'm going to make... accept. I'm going to accept. No, I'm going to accept your offer. I'm going to accept your offer because once before you and I had an opportunity to resolve a circumstance and we did, I accept your offer and I look forward to meeting with you. And I'm going to ask that your staff contact my staff immediately so that we can arrange such a meeting. So I, I, done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to thank all of you for coming before the committee today. Uh, just in background, I am from Texas. I'm a small business owner for 51 years. I still own my business. I'm a car dealer, and there's never been a day in my life that I haven't owed money to a bank. And with that being said, I've said it many times, the United States banking system did to uh, what it did to respond to COVID-19 and get PPP money into the hands of struggling businesses was something no other country, I believe, could have pulled it off and no other banking system. I know you had employees working around the clock when PPP first opened to process as many loans as possible and help your customers in some of the most uncertain times of the pandemic. Your banks were instrumental in making that happen. So I want to start off by saying thank to, thanks to you and all your employees on behalf of the millions of small businesses that were able to survive because of their hard work. We all know that a strong banking system is essential to building a strong economy. Your institutions and the community banks they help and support allow entrepreneurs to get the necessary capital to start their own businesses, expand operations, and hire more people. And we need to make sure you can continue getting money out to Main Street America and supporting small business owners like myself and others instead of navigating additional regulations and uh, reporting requirements from the federal government. My hope is we can all get your banks 
hiring more loan officers and compliance officers over the next few years so we can get our economy back on track and away from this liberal socialistic agenda that we hear from the Democratic left. So my first question uh, to you, Mr. Monahan, did your bank run into any government regulations during the pandemic that uh, prevented you from making additional loans that we should, we as Congress should be looking to reevaluate as we look to get the economy back to pre-pandemic levels? I, I think obviously there's a lot of regu regulations we could think that could be fine-tuned based on what we learned in the pandemic, some of the liquidity rules and stuff, which are quite net technical. But even to the question of these small loans, uh, the Federal Advisory Committee just gave the Fed a presentation of which they had, the 12 banks are representative of all the banks said, you know, we need to work on the appraisal process, the appraisal regulations, because for these smaller balance loans, it might be a $50,000 loan, which is going to have a property improved to go to 100000 or something like that. The appraisal guidelines would never let you go to the $100,000 loan. So I think there's ways that we can, with the safety and soundness of this industry and the great work they've done, move some of these rules, knowing that the banks you know, are well-regulated, well-capitalized, very liquid, and could help. But sometimes those rules do constrain. So that's just a very specific example, which was a topic earlier in the conversation. Well, when you have these rules, it affects your consumer, too. So uh, the less regulations, the better the consumer service gets from you. So the Biden administration has proposed increasing taxes. We talked about this already this morning to pay for the progressive wish list that is being discussed in Congress. But if we increase the corporate rate or raise the capital gains tax, it will make the uh, uh, long-term economic prospects of America much less attractive. We know this. We all know that when the government takes a larger portion of any business's profits, it will cause them to invest less back in their own operations and be very defensive. But for global institutions like your own, all of you, these actions would be even more detrimental. This would increase the competitive uh, uh, advantage that the international banks have uh, over all of the institutions that are before us today. And my question to you, Mr. Diamond, uh, can you discuss the challenges that your bank currently faces against international competition, specifically China, and how raising taxes uh, as the Biden administration wants to do, could make the challenges even harder for you. Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, the, the way to look at this is, you know, obviously most of these banks are doing fine now, and people often say, because you're doing fine, it's not a problem. But over a long period of time, we have to compete with the Chinese banks, and they're, I think they have huge advantages in terms of how their regulations are dealt with and how ours are calibrated around things like GCIFI, and America was gold-plated, so we were all essentially you have to hold much more capital than our Chinese or Japanese competitors. That would be a very big one. Uh, and another one would be how the LCR, the liquidity ratio that Brian mentioned, stops us from doing a lot of intermediation in the markets that we could otherwise do in the United States. Well, thank you for that answer. And uh, less uh, government regs works better, lower taxes works better, and uh, keep our economy going. Uh, with that, Madam Chairman, I uh, give you back my time. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter, who is also the chair of the Subcommittee on Consumer Protection and Financial Institutions, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And to our panel, uh, I would just want to restate my thanks to all of you for leading your institutions through a difficult time. And I want to uh, also agree with Mr. Williams uh, in terms of your uh, lending through the PPP program. It wasn't without hiccups, it wasn't without some glitches, but it was pretty solid. And so I want to thank you for both of those. Uh, Mr. Solomon, in his opening, credited uh, Dodd-Frank uh, for uh, the ability and the strength of the banking sector as it went into the pandemic, as, as it has come through the pandemic, uh, to one of the things that's helped uh, the banking sector be a strong shoulder to rely on uh, during this period of time. Uh, can all of you raise your hands if you agree with the way I've paraphrased his testimony? If you think Dodd-Frank uh, is due some credit for us getting through the pandemic. So I see Mr. Gorman, Mr. Diamond, Ms. Frazier, Mr. Scharf, Mr. Moynihan, and Mr. Solomon. Thanks. I appreciate that because um, uh, you know, and, and I appreciate what you said, Mr. Diamond, there's always an issue, too much capital, too little capital, but everybody came into this thing strong and was able to absorb a real shock 
to our economy. So thank you. Mr. Scharf, I've got a couple questions for you. Um, as a customer of the bank for, I was told, 44 years, uh, I just want to understand where you are on the various consent orders uh, that uh, the bank has had to enter over the course of the last several years. Uh, I think there's been some progress. I'd like to hear where you are. Yes, Congressman, um, we believe we're making progress, but um, we're but, the, but we we're also very very clear that this is a multi-year journey, just given the amount uh, uh, of work that has to get done here. Um, we have made extensive changes inside the company, from the management team to how we run the business to how we prioritize the effort, uh, and the way we are going about this work is completely different than it was in the past. Ultimately, um, this is all about creating a, you know, a sustainable uh, set of systems and processes inside the company uh, that's appropriate for a company our size and complexity. And so we are completely committed to having this be our number one priority. And ultimately, our regulators will decide when each of the individual pieces of work are done to their satisfaction. Okay, thank you. And as I said in my opening as the chair of the CPFI, two responsibilities in that committee. One, the solvency and stability of the banking system. Two, co consumer protection and making sure uh, we don't face uh, increasing sharp practices uh, in financial sector. And Ms. Maloney described the Credit Card Act that she passed a number of years ago. I'm concerned that we see some uh, practices seeping back into the financial sector. And so, Mr. Diamond, I've had a couple complaints raised uh, with respect to Chase credit cards that the default rate has been um, increased substantially, even as the bank has been making substantial profits. Must be, it must be your mic, Mr. Diamond. Somebody's mic. Let me go. So I guess the question is, um, it recently, has the bank increased the default rate under its credit cards to most of its members? Oh, uh, Mr. Diamond, can you hear me? Would you check? Are you unmuted? All right. Let's try again. Let's try it again. One moment, Mr. Perlmutter, and we'll make up for the time. Staff, can you help us out? Now it's my on my phone. One moment. Why don't I just have him answer that at some point uh, in writing? He can hear you, Mr. Diamond, but we still can't hear. Go right ahead, Mr. Perlmutter. Okay, I was just, uh, I'll just end, uh, Madam Chair. I, I would. Uh, just make one statement on Arcago's the Justice Department brought uh, is open to uh, inquiry into that. And I just uh, advise or just recommend, as all of you know, uh, you know, keep uh, your investments uh, transparent and uh, minimize the risk. Last thing I'll say, Madam Chair, as a heads up to all of you, our subcommittee is probably going to have a hearing in the near future on what does the banking sector, what does your bank look like? in 10 years. And we know you do that kind of scenario planning and we're interested in that, uh, having that as a subject of a hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Palmutter. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. Thanks, Madam Chair. And I, I empathize with you on trying to run this hearing uh, remotely. I hope we can get back to the hearing room uh, so that we can uh, do this in person and not have these uh, distractions. So thank you for endeavoring to get that done. Thank our witnesses for spending two days on Capitol Hill talking about uh, 
issues of importance both to your companies, your shareholders, your employees, as well as to uh, members of the House and Senate. We appreciate your perseverance, and I know you appreciate the five-minute break uh, every two hours. A lot of the questions have been geared towards uh, the bank's uh, political agenda or joining in on the political agenda inside the Beltway, responding to uh, progressive pressures from the left. And as a former bank CEO, having been in your shoes, albeit at a community bank, both public companies and private companies, I'm not going to spend my time here today telling you how to manage your day-to-day operations. Only you and your board of directors know how best to run your business on behalf of your clients, the shareholders, the regulators, and the larger communities that you participate in. I do want to share a few thoughts on what I've heard over the last couple of days and make sure that your companies and your management teams are being thoughtful in how you respond. I want to spend my time talk a little bit about the climate risk disclosure process that we've been debating here in the House Financial Services Committee. These are mandates on all public companies, and in fact, some are contemplated for all private companies as it relates to climate financial disclosure. And it's based on the task force on climate related disclosure, which I've talked about in the past. Many of you have stated that you're complying with the Partnership for Carbon Accounting Financials, which claims to help financial institutions assess and disclose greenhouse gas emissions from their loans and investments through GHG accounting. But this is precisely, I think, the challenge in making this a mandate. As I understand it, this PCAF is built off the task force recommendations. And yet that task force, chaired by former Mayor Mike Bloomberg and staff with several now Biden administration officials, states that disclosures have to be reliable, verifiable, timely, and objective, and comparable across portfolios and across industries. And yet this issue of GHG admissions trying to come up with scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions, they say in the Bloomberg report, are very challenging and not doable right now. And in fact, they offer uh, not to use GHG and instead use something called a carbon intensity matrix. So my concern about these mandated disclosures are we're not ready to do that in the financial industry that will really provide value to investors. I believe you all echoed something to the effect uh, in a question answering Senator Smith's question yesterday that there should be standardized climate disclosure. Well, that would be good sometime in the future when I think that's possible after a study and agreement industry by industry. And I think Mr. Barr covered that topic uh, well. Let me turn to uh, China and uh, ask uh, you, uh, Ms. Frazier, Uh, about how you're thinking about China as it's changed its economy since 2012 and 2013 to be more aggressive in trying to displace the U.S. as an economic uh, leader in the world and exerting its military. This is something we've never faced before where we're trying to do business with a big country, and yet how do you assess the risk to your doing business in China? Yeah, we serve uh, we serve multinational companies from all over the world. Many great American companies that are participating in the growth in in China. We follow our clients to where they're doing business. Um, obviously, there are concerns around a, a number of different topics in China, from human rights um, and the military financing, and uh, we. We certainly would never finance uh, any institution um, that's involved with uh, the military in China um, and the financing of that. Uh, We see them playing an an increasing role around the world. And again, I think it's one of the reasons it's critical that we have American banks playing a, a role globally. Well, we appreciate American banks leading the charge on economic freedom at home here for that student just getting out of an HBCU looking for a job and buying a house, but also around the world. But I think risk management uh, is putting your company at risk and your clients at risk because it's hard in that opaque system and the one belt, one road approach for you to be able to judge what's a good deal and a bad deal and what's a compliant deal and what's not a compliant deal. Uh, Mr. Diamond, I want to uh, welcome you to Arkansas. Glad J.P. Morgan is coming to Arkansas. And I want to submit a letter, uh, a question for the record about the Federal Reserve policy, and I'll do that. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yield back. Thank you very much. And we're going to take a five minute recess to see if we can straighten out the little technological problem uh, that we have. I do not want Mr. Diamond to miss his opportunities uh, to share his thoughts with us. And so uh, we will be in recess for five minutes.
to order. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. It was reminded me of the movie Young Frankenstein. Every time they said Frau Blucher, the horses would get scared. Every time they said Jamie Dimon, it looks like the computers would get scared. Thank God we fixed that. Um, one of the most remarkable things that I heard today was the first three people that spoke, and again, thank you all of you for being here, um, spoke with uh, really some pride, I think, in being either sons of immigrants or immigrants themselves. I think, Mr. Diamond, you said that you were the, the grandson of Greek immigrants, and I think that, um, Ms. Frazier, you stated that you were an immigrant, and certainly your elegant English um, proved that. And then, Mr. Gordon, you stated that you were an immigrant, and your English proved that. Sorry, but... And then, Mr. Moynihan, I was surprised that you broke the daisy chain with a name like Moynihan. I knew Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He used to come to um, Fordham when Father Joe Hare was the president. I was a I was a Jesuit scholastic at the time, and they used to have great stories about being Irishmen. Um, the reason I, I mention all that is around here, oftentimes, you hear, uh, sadly, uh, ugly words like illegals and anchor babies, and even one member said wet back, although he did walk it back to be truthful. And I guess I look at Christian, I look at immigrants the way that the Bible looks at immigrants in Leviticus. Um, if you recall, it says, um, <clears throat> when an alien lives among you, treat him as your native born, because you too were immigrants in the land of Egypt. Or in Matthew 25, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. So once again, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and thank you again, Mr. Diamond. I think you said that hopefully we'll get back to public policy and do it right as Americans. And one of the things that you mentioned was immigration. And I hope that we do do that right. So again, thank you again. <clears throat> one of the things that I used to hear here all the time was Dodd-Frank, how terrible it was. That's all the Republicans could talk about. In fact, I thought it was the spawn of Satan or something. And now not a peep out of them. Now we hear it instead from the bankers saying, hey, it's working well. It worked well. We need to adjust it here and there on some of the leverage issues. I understand that, but it worked well. Now, of course, the spawn of Satan has become this environmental issues. Oh, and, and I believe deeply in ESG and that we have to have metrics. But now you hear them saying, oh, this is terrible. It's, it's a horrible thing. But the reality is that the environmental issue is important. So is the social and governance aspects. Now, it seems to me that you guys do take them seriously. Um, why don't I ask first, Mr. Um, let me see. I believe that uh, Mr. Moynihan, you you take these things seriously in your bank, do you not? Uh, uh, yes, we do. And we publish an ESG report like many of my colleagues do. And we've also, just to go into the metrics to measure, we've been working with the big four accounting firms and have 80 companies have signed on to voluntarily disclose what we think the relevant constructive metrics are that are different, that take the best of what's out there but make it simple so a company can actually do it. And that way we can then stay with those oil companies who declare you know, what they're going to do and, and help them make the transition that they've all declared. Thank you. D does anyone not think that the environment, environmental issues and ESG is not important? If you don't think it's important, speak up right now, please. Let the record reflect that I didn't hear anyone speak up. See, the reality is that the climate is changing. And if you even listen to some of the people that are even Republicans, the, the leader of the World Food Program saying there's 280 million people marching towards starvation. And why is this? Because of conflict and because of environmental change. Those are the two things. We have to take these things seriously. And I'm glad that the banks are. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time here, but I do want to talk about foreclosures. I am very concerned because June 30th is when forbearance goes away as a federal issue. And I heard some of your statements earlier, but I hope you do work with these customers because I think that last time uh, th this happened, you didn't do a good job and you got a black eye because of it and you deserved it. But this time, I think you have an opportunity to work with people because of th this wasn't their fault. I mean, this was a pandemic for God's sakes. 
work with these poor people to make sure that they can stay in their homes. And I think that this time you won't get that black eye. It'll be just the opposite. You'll get praised for it. So again, my time's up. I thank you for especially the immigration. Mr. Moynihan, next time, do not break that daisy chain, for God's sake. You should have continued it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vargas. Now the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is now recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairwoman, I thank our colleagues, uh, and I thank our witnesses. Uh, for our witnesses, I think, my, what uh, an interesting time it must be to try to navigate these waters as CEO, CEOs of uh, some of our nations and, frankly, some of the globe's largest banks and financial institutions. Uh, what we've seen today is essentially <clears throat> the challenge of navigating this new woke heresy code. Uh, if you transgress it, you're forced to repent publicly. Who knows what uh, remuneration or other penance you might be called to pay for the sins of people past, but be assured there is no grace in this new woke heresy system that some of my colleagues are trying to foist upon our country. Uh, uh, and the other challenge is you have a similar authoritarian regime in China, the next largest economy, trying to force their system on us. I will at least say that in China, they're completely hypocritical. While they're <coughs> engaged in uh, horrendous acts against the Uyghurs, uh, they ask to pretend that there's a moral equivalence between China and the United States conduct with respect to treating of ethnic minorities. Uh, certainly, we can acknowledge sins of the past, but we should focus on the sins of the present. So I, I appreciate the challenge that you all have to navigate uh, so that you may permitted, be permitted to operate your businesses. So uh, the challenges are, are difficult just talking about the politics, but let's get to the actual policy. So Mr. Sharp, in recent uh, stress tests, the Federal Reserve completed in December 2020, the large bank post-stress capital ratio was 9.6%, more than twice the regulatory minimum. Obviously, this is reassuring because it shows that large banks are adequately capitalized. However, do you think that it also shows that our current capital requirements may be out of balance and the Fed should revisit these issues? Do you believe that uh, this approach could be impeding economic growth? Congressman, I, mean, I think there's uh, no question that uh, the banks have a substantial amount of excess capital at this point. The results that come out of the stress test are obviously very idiosyncratic to what the individual uh, assumptions are for that uh, scenario, as well as each of our position. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's hard to draw a conclusion from any one specific stress test. Uh, but I do think that when you look across uh, the industry, uh, there's, you know, a, 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 uh, an exceptional amount of capital in the system, um, also because of the restrictions that the GSIBs have had more recently. Uh, thanks, thanks for your answer. Uh, I, I would love to spend more time on that, but I have a couple other topics I want to get to. Mr. Diamond, uh, last month reports were circulating that JP Morgan was looking to offer a Bitcoin fund for private wealth clients. I've been following your rhetoric on cryptocurrency. I've spoken to you in the past about uh, cryptocurrency, um, but you've obviously walked back comments from saying Bitcoin was a fraud to now saying it might not be your cup of tea. Um, uh, I, and that you do agree that uh, uh, regulations are needed, but you believe it's important for Congress to provide regulatory certainty so that firms such as JP Morgan can offer additional crypto products. Can you describe how your views have changed over the past few years on, on this uh, important area and why Congress needs to provide regulatory clarity for this asset class? Yeah, so um, I, they haven't changed that much. And put aside blockchain and put aside stable coins, which are supported by assets. Something that's not supported by anything I do not believe has much value. My own personal advice to people is stay away from it. Uh, that does not mean the clients don't want it. This goes back to how you have to run a business. I don't smoke marijuana, but if you make it nationally legal, I'm not going to stop our people from banking it and et cetera. I don't tell people how to spend their money, regardless of how uh, I might personally feel about some of the items that people might buy with their money, stuff like that. So we're, de we're debating, should we make it available in some way, in a safe way that people can buy and sell it and put it in the statement systems? But 
my own personal view, it's nothing like a fiat currency. It's nothing like gold. Uh, buyer beware. And I do think that eventually the regulators who are day late and a dollar short should be paying a lot more attention to the future, like payment for order flow, a high frequency trading, right. cryptocurrency, and put a legal regulatory framework around it. That thank thank, thank you so the much. In the last few seconds I have, I just ask that if any institutions represented here today have policies that prevent your donor advised fund donations to certain 501c3 organizations based on political uh, affiliation or causes they support, uh, could you please coordinate with our office? We're trying to understand uh, who's blocking people from using the donor advised funds they have established. And frankly, my concerns aren't so much with the GSIBs, though they're not absent. It is an issue broadly, and we'll be working on a letter soon uh, to, to address to the SEC. Uh, my time has expired, and I yield. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Foster, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And am I audible here? Yes, I can hear you. I am. Okay, thank you. Um, many of you were probably on shift 10 years ago during the Tea Party default crisis of 2011 when federal debt suffered a ratings downgrade uh, that was caused when newly elected Republicans threatened to default on the U.S. debt by blocking an adjustment of the debt limit. Um, the resulting panic cost the stock market over a trillion dollars and cost the average American over $10,000. It also delayed the economic recovery by somewhere between six months and a year. Now, normally treasury bonds are some of the safest instruments in the world because the U.S. has always paid its debts. Many other rates are pegged against U.S. Treasuries, including mortgage rates, which are fixed against the 10-year Treasury. And a default caused by failure to raise the debt ceiling would impact our housing market and hurt hardworking Americans in many ways. Um, and so in the United States, we have this anomalous rule called the debt ceiling that does not occur in uh, really any other advanced country and triggers an automatic default on, on Treasuries. Um, now, there are troubling signs politically that we may be headed for another default crisis. And so my question to you is, how do you handle a, a default on U.S. Treasuries in your risk management and stress testing? Oh, Jamie, always, everyone always picks on Jamie, so <laughs> I'll let you go first. I mean, you know, how do you handle, how do you manage such a risk? And what would you do the day after we default on our Treasuries? I hope that we don't have to start doing a review of that again. It would be an unmitigated disaster. We spent like $50 million just investigating that issue, if I remember correctly. And I don't want to have to brush up on that. But there's some very complex questions which you, which you shall have to answer. Do treasuries cross default? Can the Federal Reserve by default to treasuries? What happens to default to treasuries in pension plans, investment plans, uh, bank accounts, uh, accounting rules? Uh, it, it could cause an immediate, literally a cascading catastrophe of unbelievable portion and damage America for 100 years. Oh, thank you. I think that's a pretty good summary of, of just everyone that's looked at this. And, you know, again, this is an uh, uh, instance where I think we need one of these red flag rules that removes a gun from Congress's hands. Um, and, you know, as you, as you may be aware, there have been numerous uh, proposals to, uh, to permanently repeal uh, this debt limit rule that triggers the automatic default. Uh, you know, by members on, on both sides of the aisle. And frankly, both parties have been guilty in weaponizing the default. You know, when George Bush went and spent a lot of money on a war and then lowered taxes, um, you know, the Democrats gave him a lot of grief over the necessity to raise the, uh, raise the federal debt when that happened. And, uh, you know, it's the same thing has happened in mirror image. And so I think it's really, it's really important that, that people at this time when it's not an emergency, just step back and say, yes, this is one of the good workman-like fixes that we should put forward on a bipartisan basis. Uh, because, you know, the threat is so real and the benefits are near zero. Um, so does anyone else have um, comments on specifically, do you actually, you know, because the odds are not zero. You can see threats already happening from the other side of the aisle. Oh boy, we're going to go cause trouble over the debt ceiling. Um, do you actually have planning um, sessions where you say, what do we do? Or is it just one of these things like planning for a nuclear war that's so bad that you you can't really realistically plan for it? Can well, any of you just indicate that you that you actually, this is part of your normal planning, uh, dealing with a federal default? 
we, I we, take, we take a look at lots of tail scenarios, and this is one of them. But I think, uh, as Mr. Diamond said, you know, it's a imponderable to think that we get in the position, and and I think uh, the market often takes great comfort at the time this comes to the fore when bipartisan people say it won't happen. But I think it's something to be very careful about. So we take into account as a tail tail risk, and it's it wouldn't be it would be very bad. Okay. Well, I, unfortunately, I think you should start uh, taking the possibility more seriously, and and maybe think about using some of your um, you know political muscle to encourage members on both sides of the aisle to to hold hands and jump on this, and just take this take this disaster scenario that really provides no benefit to our com to our country to just take it off the table once and for all. Uh, that was the point I wanted to make, and with that, I'll yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for convening today's hearing, and I do thank the witnesses for appearing. Mr. Monahan, if I, if I could to you, there was a story that posted uh, within the past few hours to the Wall Street Journal website. And I, I'd like to read the headline. The headline is, Biden budget said to assume capital gains tax rate increase started in late April. In other words, it would be retroactive. And it says Congress must still approve any rate changes and retroactive effective dates. My question, Mr. Monahan, to you is, if uh, a retroactive capital gains tax rate increase were to become a reality, would that have a negative effect on the economy? And if so, how? I think if you think about it from two sets of people, uh, general investors and the capital gains rate affects all investors. Many investors invest through, even through mutual funds and stuff, and the capital gains that can report out to them at a higher rate would affect them. And it, it, but importantly for uh, businesses, uh, small businesses, trading hands and stuff, retroactivity is sort of never in anybody's mindset. And I think it would have a bigger effect if it were retroactive than if it could be planned for in the future. Um, but in any case, those businesses are, are very worried about it as we said earlier. Thank you, Mr. Monahan. Ms. Frazier, can I ask you those same two questions as it relates to that Wall Street Journal story? Thank you. Um, I, I very much agree with Mr. Moynihan that retroactivity creates a lot of confusion and I think um, unnecessary consternation for, for investors and for companies involved um, that you know, should be ideally avoided. Uh, we're seeing a, we're in a very low rate environment at the moment. We're seeing a lot of uh, savers, which includes retirees and pension funds and others, uh, moving to longer dated assets, and therefore a change in the um, in these rules would would have a would have an impact on that at a time when the returns on people's savings are already low. Thank you, Ms. Frazier. Mr. Solomon, can I ask you those same two questions? Assuming that 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 story is is true and it became a reality. Would it have a negative effect on the economy? And if so, how? I I, I think any time, and 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 I think both um, uh, both both uh, both of my colleagues have commented on this. Uncertainty um, obviously dampens growth and dampens activity, and so anything that's retroactive creates extra extra uh, extra anxiety and extra uncertainty, and that would just slow down economic activity. Uh, and so I think retroactivity is something to be very very cautious about. And I do think, you know, uh, a, a chilling of investment activity through higher capital gains tax is something to also think through carefully. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Diamond, can I ask you those same two questions? Yeah, I can't add anything of substance to what my colleagues have already said. Uh, if I could take it one step further, there, there's been talk of other tax hikes. We, on this uh, hearing today, we've talked about uh, a possible increase in, in uh and corporate tax rates. If there were any tax rate increase this year as it relates to any taxes, and they were retroactive as it relates to, to any tax increase, would that be negative as it relates to the economy? Yes, but pretty much like uh, my colleagues already described. But even, you, more so it relates to, even more so because it relates to business. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Gorman, can I ask you, please, those same two questions, uh, assuming that that story is true, assuming that Congress were to enact retroactive uh, 
capital gains tax rate hikes, would that be negative to the economy? And if so, how? Yes, because every business and every individual deserves to know what the tax regime is when they're making their decisions. So by definition, my view, any retroactive tax is unfair and and uh, not good for not good for confidence and sentiment. Thank you, Mr. Woman. And Mr. Scharf, if, if I could ask you those same two questions in my remaining time. I, I agree with what everyone has said, and I would just stress uh, what uh, uh, James just, just said. People make decisions um, based upon a set of rules that they believe are in place. Um, and if you change that, uh, it calls into question any future decisions that people make and could be quite harmful. Thank you, Mr. Scharf. Madam Chair, with my remaining 16 seconds, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Gothheimer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to our witnesses for being here today. Very grateful. Nearly 50 million Americans don't have a credit score and are left out of the traditional banking system. According to the CFPB, Black and Hispanic adults are the most likely to lack credit scores. This absence of credit history limits opportunities to qualify for student loans, a small business credit line, or a mortgage to buy a home. Mr. Diamond, if I can start with you, sir. Uh, your bank utilizes information on your customer's banking activity to extend credit. Has this been successful in providing access to credit for more customers who may not otherwise be eligible? And what are some of the benefits and risks your institution has had to navigate in utilizing this source of information? Yeah, so we've been using alternative sources of information to provide credit. This is a great way we all can work together. I don't know if you saw the article that all the banks are now sharing banking data with each other in a way to extend more credit to those who need it. Uh, and uh, I think it's a great way we can all accomplish some of the same goals we all want. Uh, it's been projected, uh, so reported that out of your bank's participation in Project REACH, the OCC program to increase access to credit for underserved communities, as you were referencing, JP Morgan will be working with other banks to exchange data to further identify credit worthy customers. What more do you think we can be doing to expand credit access for underserved communities? We're, we're going to be using a lot of alternative data, like do you pay your rent on time uh, to, I'm almost going to call it reverse discrimination, seek out those who have good credits that are not in the normal credit system, uh, including immigrants who are here that have credit histories in their foreign countries. And so a lot of ways to do this, and we uh, com completely applaud uh, Project REACH. Thank you, sir. Mr. Moynihan, uh, your bank has more than 23,000 employees in New York City and New Jersey. Every day we're hearing more and more about families fleeing from uh, New York and New Jersey because of, uh, especially because of affordability, uh, therefore moving to low cost states like Texas and Florida. Do you support making it more affordable to live and work in North Jersey and New York by reinstating the state and local tax deduction, in other words, known as SALT? I, th I think the uh, SALT has had an impact that uh, has been well written by, I think our job as banks is to uh, continue to support the people who are in those communities. Uh, interesting enough, if you start to see the fact that alone we're bringing back uh, probably 6,000 kids who have never really resided in New York City over the last three years are now coming back to work. I think you'll see a lot of positive momentum in some of the housing in New York in just terms of filling up those apartments, which then uh, that were empty and things. So you know, we've got to do it through our lending. We've got to do it through uh, our employment, but uh, also it would be helpful, I think, if the tax rates are more normalized. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Solomon, I know that Goldman Sachs does not uh, have desks that are actually involved with trading cryptocurrencies. But I understand your, uh, and I know your bank can own or trade cryptocurrencies for regulatory reasons. But you have many clients who are coming to you for advice on investing in digital assets. How do you help them navigate the risks of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? Um, so I appreciate the question, uh, Congressman. Uh, and you heard a little bit um, from Jamie on this. There's a lot here, and it's complex. Uh, there is no question that both institutions and uh, individuals are looking for exposure to Bitcoin. We're trying to provide information to them uh, around uh, the potential asset class. Uh, like Jamie, when you talk about cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin specifically, I'm extremely cautious. There's no question that if lots of people believe in something, it can sustain value for a period of time, but the use cases are relatively unclear and the regulatory and government oversight um, is still relatively unclear. And so there's a lot of work to do around this. Uh, I think buyer beware is absolutely the right thing to think about, uh, but there's no question there's significant interest. And so we're trying to help our clients and track it accordingly. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman, I uh, yield back my time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Budd, is now recognized for five minutes. I thank the chairwoman and I thank again our guests for being here. So I've long supported the services that banks provide to our communities and the great work that you all did during the pandemic supporting consumers and small business. It's a prime example. So that's why it concerns me when I see financial institutions really shift their focus and moving from carrying out uh, to carrying out political and social agendas instead of just providing capital and liquidity to consumers and to businesses. So as an industry, I really believe that you should be focused on being a good neighbor by providing greater value to your consumers and your shareholders. So I want to ask you all a yes or no question and I'll go around, but um, as your banks begin to shift your business decisions and include more ESG or environmental, social and governments goals, are any of you all concerned that this may cause affected industries? And I think of, uh, as an FFL, I think of legal firearms and I want to add coal, oil, et cetera, that have thousands and hundreds of thousands of jobs in this country. Are you concerned that with more ESG and banking that they could lose investors, forcing these businesses to move operations overseas or even close and create job losses here in the U.S.? And Mr. Moynihan, as a North Carolinian, I'll start with you. Well, uh, Mr. Bud, I think a perfect example is what we did with Duke Power in our backyard there. We basically, because of their commitments to provide more clean power and our commitments to buy more clean power, we put up a large installation, which now other people can purchase from. So I, I think these commitments are consistent with good business and growth in the companies. And when good and Duke Power are you know, a major power company that has all sorts of sources in their environment, we help them we help make a contract come to life. So it's a great business opportunity. I think we all have to have judgment at the pace of the transition to make this happen. Thank you. And I want to just make sure I understand the question uh, as I continue. Do you think ESG and focusing not just on providing capital to businesses, but including ESG, do you think that could hurt certain businesses ultimately causing job losses in the U.S.? And uh, Mrs. Frazier. I think we're seeing some, some industries which are um, – we're reducing down in size, for sure. Um, we're seeing a reduction in the size of the coal sector, for example, as other industries in the energy sector grow. So I think that will be part of the natural transition. The important piece, we've, which I think we've all talked about, is that we support our clients in making the transition, uh, making sure that there is a good balance between that energy policy and the move to greener and, decarbon and decarbonized technologies. Um, and that we, the most important piece is we get that balance right. Um, thank you, Mr. Solomon. Um, I, uh, I think there's no question uh, that as capital chases new opportunities, it has effect on some legacy businesses. I do think the important thing to recognize is as we direct capital toward new technologies, there are jobs that are created with that. That's one place America has always led. And I'm sure we'll lead here when you look at the transition that so many companies and so many different industries are focused on. So I think there's an enormous job creation opportunity uh, in that also. It's obviously a balance. It's a transition. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take some long, a long time. My own opinion will be financing oil and gas for quite a long time. Uh, but there are new technologies that will have an impact. They will create jobs. And that's a great opportunity for us too. Mr. Gorman Sharp, I'm going to give you a quick pass so I can use my time on a different subject. But Mr. Moynihan, uh, back to you. Like uh, many of my colleagues and uh, Mr. Gottheimer from New Jersey mentioned this earlier, uh, I'm concerned that we're ceding our position as the world leader, leader in global digital finance to countries like China. America has always been quick to embrace technology and innovation in the banking space, but recently, due to a lack of regulatory clarity around di digital assets, we're seeing innovation go offshore to Singapore. Switzerland, Japan. So one area of innovation I'm particularly interested in is DeFi or decentralized finance. So your bank issued a report earlier this year talking about that. But as DeFi innovation continues to build, how can banks engage with this technology to offer better products and services to their customers? Well, the report you're probably talking about is from our research group, which is independent of what we tell them to do. But as we operate the bank, you know, we have, I think, uh, 60 patents on blockchain. We are heavily involved figuring out that technology and whether it really has a, a purpose. More than 60% of our consumer activity, activity goes digital today. We're driving digital usage. 
when you get to the new types of things, NFTs and things like that, we'll study them, look at them. When you get to the questions my colleagues answered about holding digital assets, our clients are asking us, we're trying to figure out how to facilitate their decision to buy a digital asset, especially on the institutional side. Those are the debates going on. But, you know, all that is part of the, as you said, the ingenuity. And I think this country is, is the most innovative country in the world and has been and will continue to be. And our industries are driving. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. And uh, it is, uh, I'd like to welcome all of y'all to the committee, and I really enjoy it. Uh, uh, Mr. Diamond, I would like to uh, uh, thank you for your response to Congressman Williams uh, Green's uh, uh, concern, because it, it's very hard to make up for some of the sins of the past, but to meet with uh, Congressman Green to talk about these issues, uh, just tremendous. I would like to say to Ms. Margahan uh, that uh, uh, 43 years ago, uh, I uh, got a $10,000 loan in from, bank, from Barnett Bank uh, to go into business. And like uh, Mr. Williams from Texas, you know, I've been in uh, business uh, ever since then. And so that's the importance of uh, having a good uh, uh, relationship. Now, to the panel, there are many areas in this country that, uh, uh, that struggle to assess the financial services in areas uh, without uh, significant access to bank branches. For example, in Gaston County, one of the areas that I represent in Florida is being one of those areas. And in Gaston uh, was deemed uh, deeply affected, meaning that the county had uh, 10 fewer branches in 2012 and lost at least 50% of them by 2017. Rural communities deeply affected by branch uh, closures typically have high poverty rates, low medium income, high shares of their population with less than high school degree, and higher shares of their population who are African American are, are relative to all rural counties. Can each of you please provide a quick overview of what your branch, your bank struggle strategy is to increase access to financial services and branch presence in rural communities uh, such as gas in one of the communities I represent. Who is your everyone question on, directed to, uh, Mr. Lawson? To everyone on the panel. I'm, my, my time is going and I got another question, so I want to make sure who do you want to start with? Okay. Start with one of them. Okay, well, I'll I, I start with uh, Mr. Diamond. <laughs> um, so we, we're, we're always adjusting our fleet of branches. It's a normal thing to do. We always make sure we're serving communities. About 25 or 30% of our branches are in LMI neighborhoods. And of all the new branches, and we're opening new branches all the time, including maybe five or 600 just in the last couple of years alone, about 25 or 30 percent will be in LMI or majority minority neighborhoods. And rural, we're not very big in rural. We're looking at what we can do there. We're going to study some uh, versions of how we can uh, extend into rural banks and some of the other banks here do more than we do in the rural communities. But digital okay, is also help. digital will also helpful to fix that problem. Okay, let me go to Bank of America. Uh, uh, and, uh, because they have Congressman Lawson, yes, uh, similar, we continue to fine tune our branches. So as we uh, move branches around, we, may, we basically make sure that about 30% are in LMI neighborhoods, and that's been true all the way through time. Interesting enough, when we looked at the rural areas uh, uh, at, at the beginning of the decade, 2010, 2011, we sold five or 600 branches to small community banks to make them stronger. And so on the idea that we may not want to have them open, but we get we sold them the deposits to that, those companies and they consolidate them in parts of uh, in areas that we, we didn't think we could have served as effectively as them. So we made those companies stronger. And again, I've challenged a team like Jamie has, you know, we are, we touch within a reasonable distance, about 80, 80 plus percent of the U.S. population. We have challenged them to how we get coverage to other parts in the digital platform is uh, very capable of doing that. We have, you know, Four or five, four hundred thousand customers in states we don't even have branches in, so it's doable. Okay, thank you. And I'm gonna try to get this other question in. So yesterday, uh, it was suggested that uh, uh, by short-term lenders should not be allowed to provide their products 
which help working people. And I get a lot of them in. And I believe that banks have moved away from serving that market, which includes many of uh, my constituents. Uh, for proof, all, uh, all we need to do is look at uh, to FDIC, small dollar loan uh, pilot program, uh, and saying that, that we could do these small loans uh, with charges 36% or less. What has happened? Anyone would like to comment on that? Uh, uh, because it affects small lenders. It's interesting. You know, I I'd like to talk to her. Can anyone comment on that? The time has expired. Um, we're going to move on. Uh, if you have a question, if you have an answer, please send it in writing uh, to Mr. Lawson. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our uh, CEOs for, for being on today. Uh, and quickly, a big thank you for all that you did to help us weather the storm during the pandemic. I think it was all hands on deck across the country, and, and you all certainly pulled your weight, and, and I know uh, we're all appreciative. Um, I'm going to stay on the SPAC retail investor topic, and, and Mr. Solomon, I'm going to focus primarily questions with you because we've, we've chatted about this. Um, we had a, a hearing earlier this week on the IPO market, traditional direct listing SPACs. Uh, obviously, we've seen a, a lot come public in the last year, and I, I think it's good for two reasons. One, it means retail investors have access to more investment options. Uh, but second, the fact that we have three solid options for companies to, to come public, uh, I think it creates important options and, and competition for these companies to raise money in the public markets. I think these are good. Of course, none of these are, vehicles are perfect, and, and SPACs in particular, I believe, could benefit from clearer disclosures so retailers can, can better understand the incentives of the sponsor, IPO investors, and, and pipe participants as these SPACs uh, you know, go through their life cycle. Uh, Chairman Gensler yesterday suggested that, that this is an area the SEC is looking at, which I, I think is appropriate. Um, my, my question to you, Mr. Solomon, is in, in your view, where do you believe the disclosure regime with respect, to, with respect to SPACs could be improved such that retail investors have the right information to understand what is necessary to make a fully informed investment decision? Uh, well, I appreciate the question, Congressman, and, and you and I have talked a little bit about this. Um, I, I think there's an opportunity for more plain language disclosure so that investors really understand the sponsorship economics in plain, clear language. Uh, and they also understand the process. Uh, there are also differences around the use of projections and the de spacking process uh, as, uh, as private capital uh, funds the de spacking for a number of these. And I think there are also opportunities there to think carefully, carefully about how disclosure works in a typical IPO process and how the liability structure works in those processes versus how it might work in a SPAC process. And so there's a lot of discussion about that. I know that Secretary Gensler is giving it attention and I assume that there will continue to be evolution around this, you know, to support the continuing use of SPACs as a capital markets innovation. Thank you. And then specifically, do you think that it should be disclosed if the sponsor syndicates the risk capital? Because I know that's happening, but it's not currently disclosed. Do you think that's something we should be disclosing? I, 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 um, it, it, it would depend on how and when it's done, but yes, um, you know, particularly if it's done up front, you know, transparency, more transparency rather than less transparency in the context of something like that, I think is, is, is correct and important. And so, especially if it's being done up front or it's committed to, I think it should be disclosed. Great. And then uh, I'm going to shift to Arcagos and total return swaps. Um, so as you know, Arcagos had greater than 10% exposure to the economics of various firms, but was able to avoid the disclosures because they acquired via total return swaps, uh, meaning they didn't own the shares outright. Um, that damage was largely contained that day, but I, I think it does beg the question, two things I think it, it really focuses. One, how many other firms are out there running similar strategies uh, in your view? Do you, do you think that's sort of a systemic problem? And then secondly, do you think we should adjust the disclosure regime with respect to swaps and other instruments that allow funds, in essence, to mask the percent exposure and the leverage that they have on their, their balance sheet? Well, I think there's certainly uh, lots of significant institutional players that have exposure to equities through total return swaps. I think what was unusual here was the concentration levels, uh, particularly in certain securities where the market cap of those securities was moving very, very quickly uh, for a variety of, of, of other ancillary reasons. Um, I do think, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, 
um, that a more modern disclosure structure around total return swaps and other forms of equity ownership is something that I know people are looking at, and I would advocate that some focus there is probably a good thing for us to, uh, for us to think about as we go forward. Great. Um, and then I'm going to switch to infrastructure for a quick second. So uh, the debate we're talking about is largely about how do we pay for, for the infrastructure and what kind of infrastructure. One thing that I think we should be entertaining uh, in a serious way is the notion of an infrastructure bank, uh, similar to what's happened in Australia and the EU and parts of Canada. Um, just a quick question uh, for Mr. Solomon and Mr. Diamond, if you could. Do you believe there would be an appetite from institutional clients to help fund American infrastructure via a well-structured infrastructure bank or similar mechanism? I, I, um, I'll, I'll go first and then, then Jamie can certainly comment. I, um, there's an enormous amount of private capital that is in a position to be dedicated toward infrastructure. I think thinking about ways, whether through an infrastructure bank or other public and private partnerships to unleash that would be quite productive. Thank you. I see my time is up. Maybe we'll get your answer in writing, Mr. Diamond, and thank you. And I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Guam, Mr. San Nicolas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to all of our guests on the panel. Uh, our Pacific territories are America's gateway to our Asian markets. Absolutely. Our Atlantic territories are America's gateway to our Latin American markets. Our combined GDP in our territories is greater than 13 U.S. states. Our combined population in our territories is greater than 20 U.S. states. And yet we have no meaningful presence from any of the GSIBs on this panel in any of our territories. And so while we listen to all of this effort to um, expand access to our uh, banking system, uh, to expand American influence in uh, international uh, arenas, and I, as I hear, thirty billion dollars over five years, one point two five billion over five years, fifty million to MDIs, one hundred and fifty million to CDFIs. As I listen to uh, quotes such as an obligation to ensure that everyone can participate in the American dream, or that we have a collective interest for opportunity for all, um, I sit here as a representative of our territories, uh, witnessing a lack of GSIB investment in our territories and a lack in. Uh, exploring the opportunities that our territories present for our very strong financial system uh, to use our territorial capacities to reach out into our international markets. And so I want to very specifically ask all the members of the panel if they can um, share what their vision is for expanding into our territories, establishing a meaningful presence and capitalizing on the opportunities that we can bring to this country. And let's go ahead and start with um, you, Mr. Diamond. I mean, you raise a very important subject. This may be an area where the extra capital, liquidity, and other costs of being a GSIB make it prohibitive to want to do that. Uh, but I do, I am sympathetic to your concern. We certainly will look at what you're talking about to see if we could be helpful in any way. It may be something that's better off done by a community bank, but we'd be happy to sit down with you and discuss it. Well, on that subject, you know, I have um, GSIBs at the table who have uh, very strong investments in international markets like Hong Kong or Singapore, even exploring Taiwan now that the Hong Kong option is kind of questionable. And yet, you know, I don't hear of any uh, efforts to really explore Guam, for example, as an option when we are literally three to five hours away from every major uh, metropolitan area in Asia. And so that's why I think that um, there is a lack of awareness, perhaps, but definitely a lack of, a, of investment. And I wanted to definitely put that on the table today. Um, Ms. Frazier, if you can um, share some insight. Yes, so, uh, you know, we, we do serve, uh, um, not in a huge way, but we do serve um, clients in many of the territories. Um, and Puerto Rico is an example of one where we have, uh, you know, an important presence and a major bank there. Um, and uh, that's both for corporates um, primarily that we work with and commercial banking clients, um, but through digital uh, capabilities now, the ability to serve customers in the uh, in the territories will be an, an opportunity going forward. We're very happy to spend some time uh, exploring that further with your office. I just wanted to share that City, Citibank closed its branch at the earlier part of the century. So uh, that's something that I would really very much like to have uh, revisited. Um, Mr. Gorman? We, we are predominantly a capital markets and wealth asset management business. So 
We're in places like Hong Kong because we serve enormous capital markets, range of clients across of, uh, all of Asia. So uh, uh, Guam is probably not at the scale where we would put operations, just being completely honest about it, for those kinds of businesses that we're in. We're not in the traditional retail branch-based banking businesses or the credit card or much of the consumer lending businesses. But your, your businesses that you do in Hong Kong, that's not just strictly limited to Hong Kong proper, correct? Hong Kong is a, a staging point for Asia proper, yes? That's right. Hong Kong, New York, uh, Tokyo, London uh, are the major staging for around the world. And so, you know, Guam may not necessarily have the population um, per se within its vicinity to be a market, but definitely as a staging point similar to Hong Kong, it is something that should be looked at. Um, Mr. Moynihan? Uh, Representative Nicholas, you, I think you asked this, this question in 2019, and I think with the pandemic, other uh, things. Uh, but uh, like others, I think we should take a look and see what's doable in the context of the business that we can that we conduct. Uh, and also, is there a way to do it in partnership with other people to help build them up to supply local services better than we could? Um, so uh, you asked the question before, and, and uh, we sh we'll take a look at. It. Thank you very much. I have the same question for Mr. Sharp and Mr. Solomon, but my time is running out. But I, I would like to just reiterate, you know, that the reason why I'm on this committee is to make sure our territories are not forgotten in the largest financial system in the world that is a part of our country. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I know you'll back. Welcome. Thank you. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rose, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member McHenry. And thank you to our witnesses for being here and for staying engaged throughout this hearing. Uh, before I get uh, into my question, questioning, I do want to thank you for the work you and all of our financial institutions did throughout the last 15 months to ensure families stayed in their homes and businesses kept their doors open. The swift rollout of the Paycheck Protection Program is further proof, pr further proof that our private sector remains more efficient than our federal government. However, today I want to discuss something several of my other colleagues have touched on, which is capitalism versus stakeholder or woke capitalism. I find it unfortunate that each of your firms feel comfortable picking winners and losers based on a political litmus test. A topic we continue to debate in this committee is that of equity versus equality. I am of the belief that everyone deserves an equal opportunity for success but it is not the place of government nor of private industry to guarantee an equally successful outcome. As I've read through your testimonies and the reporting documents of your companies, equity continues to be a popular word. In fact, Mr. Solomon, you are quoted as saying, quote, when we must stand up and support, uh, or we must stand up and support organizations dedicated to the fight for a more just and equitable society not equal, but equitable. In just a few words, Mr. Sullivan, how does Goldman Sachs define equity? I appreciate the, the question, Congressman. It's a, it's, a, it's a very broad question, and I'm, I'm not sure that I understand in exactly what context um, you're, uh, you're asking it. But I, too, like you, am an American that believes deeply that everyone deserves an opportunity to have success. And I think one of the things that we can do uh, with our business is help create opportunities. When I think about our 10,000 small businesses program and the commitment we've made over the last 10, 12 years to invest in small businesses, provide education, provide capital and resources, that is helping small businesses bootstrap up, add employees, grow, have success. And so while we serve a lot of big companies and big institutions around the world, there are ways that we can use our expertise and our platform to help others come along and share more in the context of opportunity. And so a society that, that as you state, gives great opportunity to all is a society that we certainly want to be a part of. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, and speaking of winners and losers, sev several of my colleagues have talked about this today, but I cannot stress enough the importance of providing access to capital for all legal businesses. Mr. Diamond, you, uh, you, for instance, are on the record saying that you have no interest in Bitcoin, but JP Morgan Chase will allow clients to invest in Bitcoin because in your words, 
you, quote, don't tell our clients what to do, unquote. What if your client wants to invest in a fossil fuel company or a private prison? So we, um, we don't tell the clients what to do. We do make our own decisions about what we want to do based on our own risk assessments and things like that. So our clients are completely free to buy bonds or private prison. We do not tell them what to do. And, uh, and, but even with Bitcoin or even with cryptocurrencies, we want to set it up in a way we think it's safe and proper for them. We're still working on that. So, so what I'm hearing, I think, is that you have no problem investing or seeing your clients invest in cryptocurrencies that are not only volatile, but currently being abused by cyber criminals, but legal businesses such as fossil fuel companies is where you decided to draw the line. No, you, you're totally wrong. We've been quite clear that there will be fossil fuel companies for, for decades to come and we finance them and we're proud of it and we're working with them and trying to reduce their CO2. We've certainly not cut back on that and, and we have very good relations with them. We have cut back in certain areas because we think the risk uh, legal or regulatory is too high to do the business there. And, and finally, Mr. Diamond, uh, earlier uh, you pointed out in Mr. Lukemeyer's Luke uh, questioning about dealing with China, that when it comes to investing overseas, you will follow the laws of the United States and that if the U.S. does not allow certain investments, J.P. Morgan would certainly follow the law. I think it is interesting that when it comes to investing in China, J.P. Morgan is very interested in following the law. But here in the U.S., you are going well above and beyond to not do services with legally operating businesses. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Axney, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you uh, to the witnesses for being here. I want to change course a bit here and talk about housing. Uh, we all know that housing demand has been very strong and prices have gone up a lot this past year. Uh, the concern here is that that risks is exacerbating the problem that we had before, which was that homeowners uh, who normally had higher incomes uh, already were doing well, had their home, higher incomes, but younger people and those with less income and, and less wealth opportunity weren't able to get into a home that they could afford. And I'll tell you what, I hear from businesses that have trouble attracting employees because of this. Just last week, I was down visiting a local manufacturer, Wellman Dynamics, uh, who has people driving 70 miles uh, to work, literally because there is no housing uh, in that community. And we know this hurts the economy, productivity uh, is certainly affected as well. Mr. Scharf, I wanna thank you uh, for having 14,000 of your employees living in my district. And I'm wondering what your opinion is on agreeing or disagreeing that affordable housing can help us create growth. Well, I think uh, Congressman, there's no question that affordable housing, uh, first of all, I think it's something we should all be concerned with and we should all be figuring out what we can do to, uh, uh, to provide more financing um, and more opportunity, which is what, what, which, which is what really we all can do, and you can do that in a variety of ways. You can do it by making sure you're lending into uh, you know lower dollar loans. You can help people with down payment uh, 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 dollar amounts. You can help them with closing costs, and those are things that we're all very very focused on. Um, and I think you know the, the more leverage you create in that you know uh, in terms of all of us participating in programs like that, the bigger impact we can have. Thank you for that. And I couldn't agree with you more. So that leads me to my next uh, questioning. Um, good to see you, Mr. Diamond. And I'm um, just wondering about what you think may be some of the ways that we could address uh, these shortages within inequality in housing, both in terms of policy that we can be taking here in Congress, but of course, as Mr. Scharf mentioned, uh, that, that the banks can be taking to decrease that in inequity. Yeah, so uh, uh, the first thing you can do is that zo local zoning laws, if you speak to builders, local zoning laws and regulations hold them back and make things more costly. But the other thing that Congress can do, which I think is bipartisan, is that the mortgage laws for underlying mortgage got so strict and so restrictive for origination and servicing that if they were simplified without creating any additional risk, it would reduce the cost of mortgages and make far more affordable mortgages available to people, particularly between $200,000 and $300,000. And I've been talking about that for years. It has not been done. It's one of those things that needs to be recalibrated. The sooner you do it, 
We think it will be a huge boost to the American economy and to lower paid individuals and smaller homes. That that's perfect. I will talk to our, uh, you know, the committee about that. What are some of the things the banks can be doing differently? Well, we we most of these banks have already doubled down in their affordable housing and trying to get the loans out there and work with more CDFIs. And CDFIs allow them to do a great job in this, by the way. And you all have already given them a lot more money, which I I don't know. They they need to deploy it now, and we can help them deploy it. All right. Well, I'd be curious to talk about that. One, you, you mentioned homes in the two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar range. Even in Iowa, though, that's above you know our affordable housing. And unfortunately, between two thousand nine and twenty nineteen, the amount of mortgages that were made uh, for for one hundred fifty thousand dollars or less dropped uh, by twenty five percent, and those over one hundred fifty thousand grew by nearly seventy percent. I appreciate you bringing up the two to three hundred thousand because for a lot of markets in this country, that is you know, entry level, where can we do, what can we do more? Can we get more support from banks? We need more support to help us get to these lower, smaller dollar uh, mortgages. And we can work on the paperwork thing, but can we get some support that we know that you can be there for us to help with this? I think I should have said it's all lower mortgages, including under a hundred thousand to 300. Those costs are astronomical and more clarity around FHA. A lot of the banks are very coarse in FHA because of the legal and regulatory risk, and they'd be doing a lot more of it, which is very good for th that segment if those things were clarified. Okay. Uh, any other comments, Mr. Moynihan? Do you have any thoughts on how we might address this? We, uh, Chair Waters asked us about this uh, question, and we all responded to, it, to her, and there is a fall off. I think the FHA VA rules and regulations is a person our uh, last crisis as a company that had to deal with that. Um, it, it is, we've all restricted our activities point blank in, in that area. And I think it would be helpful if uh, that those rules were clarified and simplified so that uh, it would be more, it, it, it would be attractive enough to do. Right now it's, very, it's not very attractive. Thank well, you very much. Walking orders. Thank you. Since the lady's time has expired, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Hollingsworth, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, good afternoon. I appreciate everyone being here. I think a lot has been talked about what banks can do, but I want to talk a little bit about what banks have done throughout the course of this pandemic and the lifeline that they've served to countless businesses and American families. Banks have helped raise $2.2 trillion in corporate bonds and $339 billion in equity in the last year. Large banks have modified $330 billion in loans, about 6% of all loan, commercial loan balances in this country, including payment deferrals, fee waivers, and forbearances. Banks deployed almost $539 billion in commercial loans during March of 2020 alone, at a time when the federal government had not yet stood up its coronavirus response facilities or programs or financial support. Those are really big numbers and they made a big difference to a lot of those businesses that are operating across this country because of that. But I also wanna talk about other numbers that made a big difference. 727,000 employees is what I calculated between each of your firms. And I know figuratively, not literally sitting behind you are those hundreds of thousands of employees that showed up every single day to help American businesses, to help American families get through this crisis. I remember last March and April in DC when a lot of people were talking about if bank branches shut down, would there be runs on banks? If capital raises stopped, how would businesses be able to get through this? If loan processing ceased because we couldn't get people into call centers, how would mortgages still function? None of that came to pass. None of that happened because three quarters of a million Americans showed up every single day. They got up and they went to work, whether that was going to work at a branch, whether it's going to work at a call center, or frankly, going to work at their kitchen table, your employees, like millions of other Americans that work in financial services, made sure that they showed up for America. This didn't become a financial crisis because when Americans called those bank employees, they picked up the phone. When Americans were at a drive through those bank employees were on the other side of the glass. When Americans opened their apps, those apps connected. And when Americans needed a loan, bank employees were willing to email them the paperwork to help get that started. Millions of businesses are alive today because of your frontline employees. Millions of Americans can put food on the table because of your employees. And America's economy is growing robustly in part because of your employees. 
So to the tens of thousands of those employees that work in Indiana's ninth district and the millions of Americans that work in financial services all the way across this country, I want you to know you are not found wanting in this crisis. And I and this country are deeply grateful that America's economy is recovering and was able to function throughout the crisis because of the work you did every single day. So that, all that being said, I want to turn our attention to a few questions. I want to ask about the divergent trends we see between deposits and loan growth. Wave of deposits flowing into financial institutions since the last year. Between February 2021 and February 2020, commercial deposits grew $3.2 trillion compared with just, and I use that very generously, just $800 billion in growth over the previous 12-month period. So I wanted to talk to Mr. Monahan about this. Holding excess bank deposits in a weak lending environment can accompany some negative impacts, especially in terms of the regulatory requirements that you face. I was hoping that you might speak a little bit to the SLR and your decisions related to deposits and whether you think the SLR capital requirements at the right are at the right levels during this period. And if there are any changes that you think should be made to SLR to accommodate an environment where bank deposits seem to be growing robustly, but loan demand seems to be very tepid. Well, uh, thank you, number one, for recognizing all the teammates that we all represent that did go to work every day on a, and opened those branches and kept the economy going and, and did such a great job. So thank you for recognizing that. On the question of SLR, um, we, the industry has made many suggestions over the years that completely riskless assets may not have a place. And what happened was when the deposits took off and we went out and bought treasuries, left it overnight cash in the Fed. So we probably went from $100 billion to three or $400 billion overnight in the Fed. You know, you're, you were still holding capital against that. And that doesn't quite make sense and can work against the, uh, the idea of injecting uh, monetary support into the economy. So we raised the questions then. The Fed made an accommodation, which frankly didn't make a difference. We were above the levels for our company, and, and, but they made an accommodation to help ease uh, conditions. But now I think after the crisis, it's important to look at it again and make sure it's calibrated correctly because it has a governing effect on the ability to, to do what you're saying. Right. Well, thank you so much. My time is up, so I'll yield back to Chairman. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to all our witnesses. Um, I, I want to start by apologizing to our witnesses. I'm awfully troubled that some of my colleagues across the aisle who are so outspoken in their opposition to socialism and the Belt and Road Initiative seem to be so predisposed to policies that would direct our banks to invest in politically preferred industries or else. I apologize. I encourage you all to keep copies of the Wealth of Nations and send it to them if they get those letters and remind them how capitalism works. Um, Mr. Scharf, uh, the, the last time you were here, as you, we spoke about your um, exposure to the oil and gas sector and potential write-offs. Um, you subsequently posted your first quarterly loss since 2008. And I think in some of the reports I've seen suggest that over half of the past due loans was in the, the fossil fuel sector. Is is your just yes or no? Is your total exposure to the fossil fuel sector bigger or larger or smaller than it was when we spoke a year ago? Um, Congressman, I'm not sure of the answer. I'd be surprised if it were that different. Um, okay, so if it's been written down, would that imply that you have? Because there's there's the total value, right? And then there's the and then there's the total value of the initial holdings. Actually, yes, but there's a difference between adding loss reserves and actually writing down. Certainly something we can get back to you on. Okay, okay, well, I'd be interested in understanding. Um, Mr. Gorman, you said in your testimony that climate change considerations are integrated into the firm's risk management and governance processes. We have advanced diligence process in high carbon sectors. Are, are you satisfied that you have a consistent methodology for calculating the carbon impact of your investments that is used by all the portfolio companies and businesses you invest in? and by your competitors so that you have a consistent reporting standard? No, I think there's um, uh, clearly this is a space that's evolving. It's still in the infancy. Uh, okay. Various both government bodies, international bodies and, and banks are trying to sort out the right methodology. SASB, uh, clearly it's sustainability mm -hmm. accounting board that's involved in this. So no, we're in the early days. Okay, if, as, you've, as you put these the processes that you have, however imperfect they are in place, have you ever written up or down your carbon exposure as you would with a with a piece of debt? You know, if the if the utilization factor changes, 
um, you know, in ways that you look at the security from a financial perspective? Have you ever changed it or is that just at the point of investment you do that diligence? I, I don't think we have. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we have not. If, if I'm wrong on that, I'll certainly let you know. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Solomon, you made similar statements that you've been carbon neutral since 2015, will be net zero. And I, again, I think these statements are terrific. I'm not saying it's criticism. Same questions as Mr. Gorman. Are you satisfied that you have a consistent methodology and have you ever written up or down the greenhouse gas exposure? Um, so uh, so with, respect to, with respect to carbon neutral, that's in our buildings. Um, that's, 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 that's taking our buildings. Um, I'm not aware um, of... Um, I'm not aware of any material up and down, and I'd echo what James said just about the process. The process is new. It's not consistent. It's not clear, and so it's still an evolving space. Uh, okay. Um, Mr. Diamond, you said in your um, opening remarks that uh, abandoning fossil fuels is not an option right now. In, in over the suite of the investments you have in the fossil fuel space, you've got senior debt, you've got various levels of subordinated debt, and presumably some equity. Setting aside the total exposure, have you taken any steps to shift the the risk exposure in your portfolio to the space? So, in other words, have you have you shifted more towards more senior secured vehicles? I do not believe so. No. Is it reasonable to assume that if you saw a risk coming, you might take take measures to protect your to protect your investment and move to a more senior position? You certainly should assume that. Um, Mr. Moynihan, um, your bank is one of the largest financiers of fossil energy, I believe, of the folks here. Same question as Mr. Diamond. Are you changing your risk exposure? Uh, we, we look at individual credits based on their prospects. Uh, and so we have not, uh, to my knowledge, changed any material exposure in our risk today. Um, but in terms of the discussion, we continue to look at the portfolios and figure out how you can measure the types of things you're talking about and, and that work has been going on. Okay, well, I'm, I'm about out of time, but I, today I introduced the Climate Change Financial Risk Bill with Senator Schatz that is designed to do the scenario testing in our financial sector. In my view, you all are crazily smart. You are extremely sophisticated. I have high confidence that your banks are probably going to be fine because you are the most sophisticated. And when you see these risks coming, you will find ways to offload them to other people in the financial sector who are not. We have an obligation on this committee, our prudential regulators of making sure that as that cash moves around the system, as we transition to a cleaner economy, we are protected. And I hope you'll support us in our efforts to make sure that we maintain a robust financial system. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Stile, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I think we all look forward to the day where we're back in person taking advantage of uh, the access to vaccines. It's been a long time staring at WebEx. I think it has been uh, for most of us on this. But uh, let's dive right in, uh, if I can. Mr. Solomon, uh, many people in our community are deeply concerned about rising inflation. And last month, uh, we recorded uh, inflation <laughs> rates uh, nearly a 13-year high at 4.2%. Families uh, across the country, in particular uh, places like Racine or Janesville, Kenosha, Wisconsin, are seeing and feeling the effects of rising costs every day. Food, gas, uh, vehicles, everything seems to be getting more expensive. Some of that tied to the supply chain issues we're seeing. Some of it tied probably to inflationary pressures. A member of your research team recently described price data uh, from the last few weeks as, quote, pretty alarming from an inflation perspective, end quote. Uh, and among other things, he pointed uh, to some of Washington's fiscal choices as a major driver of recent inflation. In fact, uh, we've spent trillions of dollars uh, and some uh, are looking to spend even more uh, in a fiscal blowout. And while some of these fiscal effects are time limited, some will have a persistent impact, I believe, on our economy, uh, in part by shifting the, public, the public's inflation expectation. Uh, your research team has also expressed concerns about uh, falling into this, quote, uh, self-perpetuating cycle. Uh, your research department published a report earlier this year titled Fiscal Policy, uh, the next round, that correctly noted that much of the COVID era spending and the current Biden spending proposals weren't fully paid for. So what we're looking at uh, is elevated spending and more debt. Uh, would you agree uh, that the spending imposes an inflationary risk? And following on that, uh, what would you be doing with your firm uh, to prepare yourself for a potential inflationary environment? 
Uh, so I appreciate the question. There's certainly a lot of focus on inflation, and I'm finding it uh, a topic of discussion with most you know, CEOs as I talk to people and make my way around. There's no question that the current combination of monetary policy and fiscal spending combined with a reacceleration of the economy coming out of the pandemic uh, is leading to some inflation. As we discussed earlier in the hearing, uh, there's a big debate about how much of it is transitory or how much of it will be stickier and will last. I think it's, you know, I think it's hard to tell. I certainly think that we've uh, spent a lot of time thinking about, from a risk management perspective, always focused on safety and soundness and managing the institution, just being you know, more aware that a scenario where suddenly monetary policy to slow down an overheating economy raises interest rates more quickly than market participants expect is certainly something that's more possible than we might have expected uh, pre the pandemic. And so we obviously think about that and focus on the risk and the implications that that would have on asset prices and markets. But I think this is very fluid and I think we've all got to continue to monitor closely. And obviously decisions we make as we go forward will have impact on all this and the pace of the economic recovery will have an impact on all this. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Solomon. If I can jump over to you, Mr. Diamond, uh, with, a, with a similar question, knowing your uh, significant retail operation, uh, how potential inflationary pressures would impact uh, your consumers? Could you comment on that? Sure. The, the consumer, you know, fortunately is in great shape. They have a lot of cash and capability. Uh, their jobs are coming back. Their asset prices are good. Their home prices are good. And the good news is loans are down because they have money. Not They're not down because for a normal thing where they're trying to pay off debt in a recession and stuff like that. You know, inflation, I think it's coming. The only question is how much and how quick. Uh, you, we've never seen fiscal stimulus like this other than in World War II, but half of that money was spent on the war. Uh, this time, and also in 08, 08 and 09, the consumer was over, there was huge deleveraging in the years after 08 and 09, fundamentally different. If there is real inflation, the people who get hurt the most are the lower paid, and mm. because it's gas and it's food, and that causes uh, certain social disruption, and that we should be very, very conscious about. So inflation is not a good thing. It was at 1.6%. I, I don't know what's so bad about that. You know, if it goes to 2.5, I don't think it's that important. But it's more than that today. But if it, you know, hits 4% on a sustained basis, it will cause disruption for the lower paid individuals in America. I, I appreciate you, you sharing that because I, I completely agree with you that the mismatch of both the fiscal policy and our monetary policy, I have significant concerns uh, that we're going to see inflationary pressure. Uh, and it'll function like a tax on all Americans in particular. Uh, some of the lower income earners as they see real cost increases uh, and, a, and a decrease in their standard of living. And so I appreciate everyone's time here today. Observant of the clock, uh, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, panelists, as industry experts, I want to ask your opinion on several hypothetical questions to help me better understand how your bank gathers information and assesses risk before extending a loan. Mr. Monahan, if my friend Joe started a business, would Bank of America provide him with a loan? Please answer with yes, no, or I would need more information. Thank you. need more information to underwrite a, a credit. And Let's assume his financials are in good order, Mr. Monahan. Would your bank then make the loan, or are there other risk factors that you would need to take into consideration? Yes, no, or I would need more information. We look at a series of risk factors, including the, uh, the person, their credit, if it's a small business loan, and the, the person who's starting a business is probably going to base more on the individual credit, the credit scores, and other factors we talked about earlier. In the, in the so you're claiming my time, so I'll take that as if you need more information. Uh, so, Mr. Monahan, please answer with yes or no, um, or I would need more information for the following two questions. Imagine a former employee of the company told you that Joe dismissed more than half of his workforce, including the CFO, for misconduct. Would your bank lend to Joe? Yes, no, or I would need more information? I, I don't. I, we need more information to understand what the situation is. Thank you. Imagine you heard from a customer that Joe lost sensitive data and 75% of his company's earnings due to a cybersecurity breach. Would your bank lend to Joe if you heard this rumor? 
I need more information. I don't, I, if, if you're referring to Thank a specific you. case, Thank I'm you. here to talk about that. Thank you. Mr. Monahan, you just expressed to me that you will not put your bank's money on the line if you were made aware of these red flags or if you're kept in the dark about these risk factors. The hypocrisy here is unbelievable. While you expect consumers and businesses to disclose this important information about risk when they apply for a loan, you withhold the same information about your mega banks from the public and from Congress. The federal government and the public provide you with many benefits despite the systemic risks your institutions pose and the limited information you all share with us on a voluntary basis. This must end. This is unacceptable. My bill, the Greater Supervision and Banking Act of 2021, would fix this by requiring your companies to publicly disclose cases of misconduct, your approach to protecting consumer data, climate risk, employee compensation, support for CDFIs and MDIs, allowing the public to make informed decisions and Congress to conduct oversight cannot be optional or inconsistent. Thank you, Chairwoman Waters, for holding this hearing and continue to prioritize um, our role in, in oversight here. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gooden, is now recognized for five minutes. Is Mr. Gooden on the platform? If not, the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Timmons, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I wanna thank each of the witnesses for taking time out of their busy schedules to come before the committee today and answer our questions. Um, yesterday in the Senate Banking Committee, you all said you believe capitalism is the economic system that produces the best economic outcomes. Capitalism is defined essentially as conducting business in such a way as to earn a return on invested capital. But my question is, can your banks process a $500 loan for a term of 90 days for a new customer for a $45 fee? Uh, that's the amount of revenue that would be earned on such a loan at 36% APR. And obviously, if one such loan defaults, it would wipe out all of the revenue for 10 other such loans that are being paid when due. Um, so tell me how financial services operators could feasibly provide this kind of short-term, small-dollar loan on a sustainable basis. Uh, Mr. Diamond, it, you said yesterday that you would support a 36% cap on all loans pending a review. If such lending cannot be done profitably, what is the sustainable source uh, of access to credit for the millions of customers who require this kind of short-term, small-dollar loan? You are asking a great question. It does cost money to produce a loan and underwrite it. And if that, if that cost goes into APR and you include that in the 36%, it's impossible to do loans like that and make a profit. We, that's precisely why we don't do it. And there's no safe harbor. It doesn't affect us. So I'm not gonna fight that bill, but I do think it does push out uh, some institutions. There are a lot of non-banks and shadow banks and payday lenders <clears throat> and all who do that business, but they don't bear the legal and regulatory risk that we do. Sure, no, I appreciate that answer. Um, uh, Mr. Frazier, uh, you said yesterday you supported the spirit of the proposal, but want to make sure that there are no unintended consequences. I think it is fairly obvious there will be many unintended consequences for short-term small dollar loans. In your opinion, would these types of loans be possible with a blanket 36% APR rate cap? Um, I, I, as we said yesterday, you know, we certainly don't charge a, a customer 36%, um, but, I, I worry about the the um, imposition of uh, flat flat caps. Um, it, they often have unintended consequences. I've seen this in many other countries where they deny access. They have limitations on access to credit, and they actually end up um, almost hurting the customers they're trying to help um, more than they more than they aid them. So I think these types of rules require very careful consideration because of those factors. We've seen it elsewhere. You've got to be very careful. Thank you, Ms. Frazier. Uh, Mr. Moynihan, companies including your firm face increasing risk of cybersecurity attacks. In addition, uh, banking agencies recognize that cybersecurity risks from third-party vendors are also increasing, and federal banking agencies recently provided guidance with respect to practices that banks can utilize 
to reduce vendor risk and improve operations. Can you please speak to how your firm approaches cybersecurity risk management and discuss any improvements uh, you have made or plan to make to your risk management frameworks, both in general and in particular with respect to vendor risk management? Well, if you go back and think about the last decade or so, this issue has gone from something that was relatively uh, relatively contained to something that we spend a lot. We spend a billion dollars a year, about 2,500, 3,000 people work on this every day. Um, they're very good. Um, we also work with the industry. So over the last three administrations, uh, we've worked with, closely with industry to create industry uh, sharing networks, uh, the ARC it's called, and FF. SAIC, I think it's called, is, is the acronym. These are all institutions to share information. So we work very hard on this. Uh, we, we, there's a white paper coming out from a group called BITS, which studies this across all industries. And that white paper is something that we would propose that represents the interest of the financial services sector as to what more can be done. Um, so we work very hard at, at uh, making sure we manage this risk well. And, and we continue to learn more about it every day. And we continue to make suggestions to improve the practice. Sure, um, I, I really appreciate it. I actually graduated from NYU with a master's in cybersecurity just last week, and many of your firms had uh, some of your executives or uh, team members in that program. So I just appreciate y'all making it a priority to um, learn from the past and make sure that we're doing everything we can to, to secure our data. And um, with that, Madam Chairwoman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. This committee will stand in recess for five minutes. We'll return. Five minutes.
The committee will come to order. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Torres, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question for the CEO of Morgan Stanley. How much did you sustain in losses from the collapse of Archego? Uh, $911 million. And Bill Wang, the head of Archegos, pleaded guilty to insider trading about a decade ago. Are you aware of his history of insider trading before entering into a quite a soft contract with him? I was not personally, but as a company, we were aware of that. Were you aware of all the other credit swap contracts he had entered into and the lack of diversification in those contracts and the extent of his over leveraging? No, there was not a clarity and transparency around his positions across the street. So given the lack of transparency and clarity surrounding the credit risk of Archegos, would you support an SEC rule requiring disclosure of a significant economic interest in a company regardless of the form that interest might take? Well, I think it's in everybody's best interest for adequate disclosure. I know um, uh, Chairman Gensler is going to be looking at this and I'd certainly work with him on it. Is that a yes or I'm not clear on the answer? Well, clearly the, the lack of disclosure here hurt, uh, fortunately it didn't hurt taxpayers, it didn't hurt investors, it hurt Mr. Wang and his uh, family office and it hurt the banks that were prime brokers to him. But generally, yes, I think this is something that should be uh, figured out and the SEC is focused on. The largest banks are earning more and more profits than ever before, but appear to be making fewer and fewer loans to consumers and small businesses. Uh, City had record profits in the first quarter, yet lending is down by 10%. Bank of America saw a doubling of profits in the first quarter, yet lending is down by 14%. Uh, my questions are specifically for the CEOs of Bank of America and Citi. Can you briefly explain to me the dramatic decline in lending in the midst of record quarterly profits? So why don't I start first? Um, our loans were down uh, largely through a series of factors. One of them was the, obviously for small business loans, $35 billion of PPP loans, uh, replaced loan credit uh, for middle market companies. Their borrowing at the percentage of their revolvers went from 35, 37% to 27%. That's tens of billions of dollars of loans. Uh, and then consumers paid off their credit cards. We had $90 billion of credit cards before the crisis, and we'd still want all those loans, obviously, because that's the, what the business we're in. So it was demand side driven by the markets. The good news is as the economy is healed and as uh, final demands come back in and the spending by consumers and businesses is growing, you've seen the loan balances start to grow this quarter, and we'll see where you end up. But the, that's been a hopeful sign. But when you think about it, to give you just a snapshot, in April 2000, uh, excuse me, May of 2021, we committed to $1.1 billion in commercial lines of credit for small businesses. That is up 30% from where it was in May 2019. So not 20 when the economy was in thing. And so you'll see loan balances grow as companies reopen and need the lines of credit and start to access their lines. I'm gonna actually move on just in the interest of time. Uh, I have a question specifically about New York City. The government of New York City draws more than half of its revenues from real estate, particularly commercial real estate, and the vitality of the New York City economy as well as the viability of New York City transit depends heavily on foot traffic from those commuting to and from the office. Uh, my question to each of the CEOs, do you plan to send most or all of your employees back to the office five days a week? And if so, when? Please provide an exact timeline. Let's start with J.P. Morgan. Congressman, so I'd say we're, we're, we don't have a long-term plan, but we're aiming for half the people to be in, everyone to be in half the time starting around uh, mid-July. And we're asking people to come in now, get comfortable, it's very safe. No one's being forced to do anything. We want everyone to be vaccinated, but we're not requiring that yet. Uh, it's quite safe. And a lot of us have been coming in every day since last June. Bank of America? Uh, yes, we've, we've started to uh, bring uh, vaccine employees back. We collected the information voluntarily from them. We have about 50,000 50, teammates that put the information and give us the ability to call them back and have them work. Um, in New York City in particular, that's uh, starting to take place. The top uh, levels uh, will be back in the office uh, effective uh, June 1st. And our goal is by after Labor Day is to effectively be back to where sort of where we were in January of 20. Citigroup. 
Thank you. Um, I'm in the office in New York myself today. Um, we're expecting to get 30% of our people back in the office in America in uh, in July, early July, mm -hmm. with a few of 50% being back in September. And we're going to take it from there, depending on the guidance of social distancing and other, other factors. I see my time has expired. So. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Taylor, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate uh, you calling this hearing. I appreciate the witnesses taking the time to be here with us. I uh, wanted to talk about inflation and overheating. Uh, we've had a couple of allusions to that. And I'll just, uh, as I go around Texas's third congressional district, I talk to auto dealers that have 10% of the new cars they usually have on the lot, on the lot. Um, I talked to a steel uh, manufacturer who, uh, you know, where he's watched steel prices go from $500 a ton to $1,600 a ton. Uh, gas prices are from one year ago are up 70%. Lumber prices are up one year ago, 300%. Uh, coffee prices up 35%. Cotton prices up 43%. Sugar prices up 54%. Propane prices up 20%. Um, do any of you uh, CEOs, and if you believe this, just put your hand in the air, I'll be happy to call you, think the economy is not overheating. So if you disagree with the statement, the economy is overheating, just put your hand in the air. We'd love to hear your thoughts on that because you guys are seeing, you know, you're collectively you're overseeing trillions of dollars in the U.S. economy. Okay, so I, I think, oh, uh, yes, Mr. Gorman, please. Yeah, I don't think the economy is overheating. Um, the economy is obviously making a dramatic recovery from a very depressed state a year and a quarter ago. We've got record low interest rates and record high fiscal stimulus, but I don't see that yet as uh, saying the economy is overheating. I just think it's growing faster than it was, and it's a function of the recovery we're under. Okay. Well, it, and Mr. Gorman, just to, since uh, thank you for thank you for volunteering that, I appreciate that perspective. Uh, do you think uh, in Washington Congress should dump a couple more trillion dollars into the economy and government spending to kind of get things back where they need to be. No, and that's obviously a separate question of, of where are we right now and where are we heading? Clearly, uh, with the global economic recovery and the amount of stimulus so far, I would be very cautious about uh, further uh, elevated levels of stimulus. Uh, at some point, the combination of low interest rates, extra stimulus and synchronized recovery becomes a problem. We're not there yet, which is why I said no to the overheating. Okay. Well, and Mr. Sullivan, I, I think uh, we've spoken about this. Uh, you talking about uh, some research that your bank did, uh, Goldman Sachs, and I actually referenced it in a previous hearing, uh, talking about uh, fiscal stimulus as a as a percentage of slack in the economy. Uh, I think your now your bank's analysis, uh, Goldman's analysis, was that uh, last year the federal government spent four times slack. Year to already this year we've spent six times slack. Uh, do you think? the prescription for Washington is to dump a few more trillion dollars in the economy to get things going again. Uh, my, uh, you know, my response to that would be very similar to, uh, to James' response. Uh, I, I think at some point the loose monetary policy and the fiscal stimulus combined with an accelerated recovery um, will create issues. I don't think we're overheating yet. I agree with that. Uh, but I'd be very cautious about putting additional stimulus in at this point in time. Mr. Diamond, I saw you nodding your head. What's your thought? I'm right with them, and I using uh, James's uh, heating analogy. We are heating up. We're not boiling yet, but we're putting a lot more fuel in the fire. And my own view is we will get to the boiling point. And I don't know that for a fact. I'm not betting that. But I just think you know, with six trillion dollars of stimulus, all the QE, the recovery, people out of the pandemic, the the balance sheets which are raring to go. I think you're going to see there's a good chance to see overheating sometime in uh, 2022. And Mr. Diamond, uh, earlier you mentioned uh, that you were concerned about inflation. Uh, I think you, you were very sure that inflation was coming. Are you changing the composition of your balance sheet in anticipation of inflation coming? Mm. You, kind of a fair you we, 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 we protect ourselves against multiple scenarios, and that's one of the sure. scenarios, yes. Okay, so you're, you're anticipating that and then financially putting your money where your mouth is in terms of changing your, your asset liability composition I, anticipation. I will refer to the 10Q, but it shows you that we've done some of that, yes. Okay, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, sir. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and then, um, 
Mr. Moynihan, do you want to comment on 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 reacting to inflation? Uh, sure. If you look at it straightforwardly, as my colleague said, the economy this quarter is expected to be as big as it was in 19 uh, before the pandemic. The growth rate projected forward is 7%, three times the rate the economy is projected growth at the time, and the interest rate environment is much more accommodative. That sets up a, a robust growth in the second half and beyond, and as we all spoke about, and also the very you know, tough discussion about whether it's inflation or not and whether that will be permanent. So I think we have to be very vigilant right now or else we could find ourselves past the point of pulling back. Thank you, Mr. Moynihan. And I would just caution my comments as we think about the next steps for Washington to not dump trillions of dollars into the economy unnecessarily. I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Tlaib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you so much for this hearing. I just want to ask one by one, uh, yes or no. Um, are you familiar with the term environmental racism? I'll start with uh, Chase. Thank. Vaguely, are you yes. familiar with environmental racism? I said vaguely, yes. Vaguely. Okay. How about you, uh, Citigroup? Ms. Frazier. Um, the same, only vaguely. I don't know the specific definition of it. That's fine. And how about you, Mr. Moore, uh, Gorman? No, I'm not. Morgan Stanley doesn't isn't familiar. Okay, how about uh, Bank of America? Are you all familiar with the term environmental racism? Uh, I, I'm vaguely familiar, but uh, seems. Yep, Wells Fargo. You Do you know what environmental racism is? I'm yes or no? Congresswoman. That's unfortunate. How about you, uh, Mr. Solomon, Goldman Sachs? Vaguely familiar, but not specifically. Well, I want you all to know environmental racism showed its face in a deadly way during the pandemic in my district, where more of my black neighbors died at a higher rate from COVID than any other community in Michigan, even though our black population in Michigan is less than 15 percent. The pre-existing health conditions that come from living in the backyard of corporate polluters financed by your banks. When it comes to racial justice, I see many of you having these commitments to just diversify your executive ranks. Good. But I think the American people really truly want to know what about the actions that are needed to invest in our communities like mine that you all profit, profited off of that left us with more pollution, decay, and poverty. You all should know and be familiar with the term environmental racism. Because for generations, black, brown, and indigenous communities have seen the fossil fuel corporations Use your banks to finance and construct oil and gas refineries, petrochemical plants, and pipeline projects. These polluting projects haven't been built in wealthy neighborhoods, as you all know. They have been built on land in frontline communities of color, contaminated our air, polluting our water for generations to come. JP Mortgage Chase, Citibank, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America, all of you collectively financed $977 billion dollars worth of fossil fuel projects and infrastructure since the Paris Agreement. That includes financing Marathon Petroleum right in my backyard. All of your institutions finance Marathon, but Mr. Uh, is it Scharf? Wells Fargo led the pack providing nearly 7.2 billion in financing Marathon over the next, or over the past five years. I want you guys to know Marathon has fought to dismantle fuel efficiency standards tooth and nail and their refineries pollute frontline communities in my district and across the country. 48217, the neighborhood I represent with Marathon there, is the most polluted zip code in the state of Michigan, a majority black community. It has literally left us with high rates of asthma, cancer. Countless families have lost their loved ones too soon because they were forced to breathe the polluted air your banks financed. So I wanna ask you all one by one, Chase Bank, Mr. Diamond, do you live near a refinery? Yes or no, do you live near an oil refinery? I do not. How about you, Ms. Frazier? Do you live near an oil refinery? No, I do not. Mr. Gorman, do you live near an oil refinery? No. Mr. Uh, is it Maiha? Am I saying it right? From Bank of America, Brian, do you, do you live no, near no, a refinery? I, I do not. How about you, Mr. Sharp? How about you? Do, you? do you have Marathon oil refinery in your backyard? No, no, I don't. How about you, Mr. Solomon? No, I don't. So I need you all, all of you to address racial equity 
what that means is understanding environmental racism and reversing decades of, uh, of, of it and halting the damage that you all continue to invest in. Please, I dare you all to come to my district. I offer this even to my members of Congress. Come and smell what my neighbors smell. Breathe what they breathe. Tell me then whether or not you will continue financing for oil refineries. Because right now it is morally unacceptable. If you truly believe in racial justice, then you would make sure that you and your team understand environmental racism in our country that has been a term used by black and brown communities since the 70s and 80s. So with that, I just ask again, Chairwoman Waters, let's please follow up and make sure these folks have the information they need to understand this term that is critically important to communities they are directly impacting in a negative way. And with that, I yield back. Thank you very much, Ms. Tlaib. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Laudermilk, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, when all of you testified to this committee in 2019, I asked questions about cybersecurity. Since we had that meeting, we've experienced the colonial pipeline, uh, colonial pipeline data breach, which everyone <laughs> realizes shut down the gasoline supply for much of the country for several days. And yet we've had another major federal government data breach since that time as well called the Solar Winds hack. Mr. Diamond, what is the latest on the cybersecurity front and is your bank using artificial intelligence to help detect and address cybersecurity threats? And so I think I, all the banks here have spent a tremendous amount of time and money and the financial services, we've been worried. This is not new. Maybe the pipeline problem is going to open other people's eyes. It's not opening ours. As Brian Moynihan mentioned, we have a, a, a bank, a, a financial services group that works with utilities to focus on this. We spend you know, directly six or seven hundred million dollars in cyber. I think the financial companies are close to the defense companies and probably way ahead of a lot of the people. Having said that, and, and we also, as someone had mentioned before, third parties, most of us do a lot of oversight in third parties and demand a lot from them about how they run their affairs to try to minimize disruption. Having said that, it is a huge risk to the system. And, and we, we can't do, more, but outside of nuclear proliferation, this is the biggest risk to the system. It's, it's not just what we do, it's what government entities do, it's what we get exchanges to do, it's what the communication companies do, which I think are pretty good at it, it's what the utilities do, uh, which I think some are pretty good at it, uh, and it's what the government, and you know, when Secretary Mnuchin was there, he did an excellent job getting all the government together from you know, the security groups the military, homeland security, uh, working with the banks and the regulators to have a common view, make sure we're partnering the way we can. And there's still a lot more we can do with the government. Uh, what about artificial intelligence? Or is there any advancement made in uh, using an it, it, AI we, we to detect use, and address these issues? We, we use an extensive amount of AI risk and fraud and outside vendors to capture as much as we can. As you know, you know, most of these companies have not been, we get attacked a million times a day. But they, you know, they've been not been able to break through in any material way. But uh, honestly, the fear of that is very high. All right, we appreciate the efforts there, and 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 I think the fear of it being high is what's going to keep us a little more vigilant. But I do think Congress must enact a national data security and breach notification standard to help uh, address this problem across the multiple states and territories. Another issue, demand for loans is incredibly weak right now. In fact, the amount of loans as a share of deposits across the banking industry is at record lows. Our economy is expanding after an extreme contra uh, contraction. So you would think there would be a robust demand for credit, but uh, the way I see it and several others do is that the, one of the main reasons for the weak demand for loans is that we have put trillions of dollars of taxpayers' money and stimulus uh, payments into people's pockets. So. Everyday Americans are getting funds from the government instead of through loans from the private sector. Mr. Monahan, uh, why is the demand for loans so low and what needs to be done to return lending to the markets to normal? Well, I think when you look at the small businesses, the PPP program, which is which was well done by the government and by the institutions on the screen here by delivering you know, 500, 600 billion dollars of what the total was was very important, but that also squeezed out private sector loan demand, as you're saying. Um, when you think about middle market companies, it, it one of your colleagues earlier talked about the auto dealers having 10 cars on the lot. That's We have auto dealer clients. Their lines of credit are way down because they just don't have the, right. the stuff to put on the lot. So I think 
There's a lot of demand there. It's building. I think you'll see the loan balances start to grow in this part of the cycle. But because of the uniqueness of the situation, I don't think we can equate it to other uh, down, downdrafts because the shutdown of the economy stopped all the loan demand overnight for a whole bunch of types of businesses. It is now coming back. And I think as you see those move the second half of the year, you'll see that start to come back through. And the amount of cash was multiples of it before so the deposits went up faster. So I do, using the loan deposit balance, I think, is a marker from a different era right now. It, it was handled completely differently, but I think it'll start to come back and sink over time. Okay. And I think so as well. And I, I would like to see the uh, economy grow itself organically and get back to where the free market is is doing this and uh, and and not dumping trillions of more dollars into the economy just to shore it up and to let it grow. On another topic, the new FDIC chief information officer recently stated that the best way to bank the underbanked is through technology. And I agree with that. And I believe policymakers should embrace uh, FinTech. Mr. Fraser, what benefits does FinTech provide to consumers and businesses uh, within credit files? Within credit files. Well, it's, it's like I'm out of time, so I'll just submit some uh, questions uh, for the record. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, is now recognized for five minutes. Ms. Adams, are you unmuted? Ms. Adams, <laughs> oh, I think she's muted. Ms. Adams, can you hear me? Okay, we're gonna move on. Who's next? We're gonna move on. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Lynch, is now recognized for five minutes. If not, the gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Thank you very, very much. I too want to say to all of the leaders here today testifying, uh, thank you for your work during this pandemic. Uh, and when I say that, I really recognize as well uh, your officers, your lenders, your employees who worked tirelessly uh, in partnership with us and the legislation that we passed in the first year in a bipartisan way to make sure that we got capital and relief out to customers, to businesses, to small businesses and beyond. So I do thank you. I, I'm particularly thinking of a, a lender of a, a bank in my area who was working around the clock to make sure that people were getting PPP. Um, I'd like to pivot to an area that I care desperately about and I bet all of you do too. This year has started once again with tragically heartbreaking and unacceptable amounts of gun violence in our country. Reported by the New York Times, there have been 232 mass shootings since January the 1st till, until May 26th of this year, over 100 more than that same period in 2020. Yesterday, as you all saw, nine more dead in a mass shooting in San Jose, California. Financial, financial institutions, your banks, are in the business of profits, as you should be, for yourselves and for your shareholders, uh, but you're also in the business of managing risk. So I'd like to ask you a few questions about how your banks are managing high risk industries like gun manufacturers and companies that are a threat to your reputation, to your shareholders, to your investors, and to your customers and employees. First, let me commend Citigroup and Bank of America for recognizing that ending gun violence in this country is, I would suggest, a decision, but also a command of corporate social responsibility. So Ms. Fraser, uh, Citigroup's US commercial firearms policy requires retail sector clients to abide by several best practices. Can you describe them briefly to us and what difference your corporate policy has made in terms of your corporate responsibility toward ending gun violence in our country? 
Thank you very much. Um, it was informed because a number of our employees were directly affected um, by a number of instances, including Parkland. And I, I spoke myself to 11 families of our employees who had been um, who had children in the school there. And so we, we decided to put um, a part of our environmental and social and risk policy. We asked the retail clients, so the retailers, to follow best practices in their sales practices um, for selling our guns. They're widely followed practices, um, but they include no, um, making sure that a background check is there at the point of sale, um, that there are no sales to under 21 without training, and there are no sales of bump stocks. Um, we felt very comfortable that those practices were ones that would help keep uh, guns out of the wrong hands. Um, and that was the thinking behind it. Well, I commend you for that. And I ask you to consider, consider other policies that city could uh, enlist uh, that would have an even greater impact. But thank you for being a leader there. Mr. Diamond, in our hearing in 2019, I remember you telling Congresswoman Maloney that JP Morgan would consider a similar policy to Citigroup and Bank of America. But I don't think any such change has been made. What is your organization doing to prevent gun violence? I, I don't think it's that different to tell you the truth and I'd have to go through the detail to go through it. But obviously any retailer who sells gun has to follow the law of the land, ATF, local laws, uh, uh, filing, per, you have to have the law, they have to file them when someone buys a gun and stuff like that. Uh, so we try to do all those same things that we do not finance the manufacture of military style weapons for civilian use though we do support we do uh, finance that for military use because we obviously support and love the american military and uh, so i don't think it's that different i i would submit to you there are a lot of laws that that are on the books and there are a lot of laws that could be changed that are on the books that could immediately fix this situation well, I would call upon you and JP Morgan to call upon the Senate to pass the two bills that we have sent over for universal background checks for the closing of the Charleston loophole. And maybe you, JP Morgan, could message uh, your strong commitment to ending gun violence in our country. Mr. Sharp, Wells Fargo is NRA's bank, a relationship you said in April of 2020 to investors was declining. What is the status of that relationship? And when you say declining, that's rather passive. Uh, have you considered actively severing that relationship? And I would ask Madam Chair if uh, the gentleman would be able to briefly answer. Please, the gentleman. A question has been directed to you, Mr. Shaw. Uh, we do not. Uh, I have to actually have to see where we are with the NRA. Uh, I believe we've exited it. Um, if not in total, we're very close to the end, uh, but I can certainly get back to you. Please get back with that information uh, to Ms. Dean. Thank you very Thanks. much. Uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. In the past year, urgently expanding access to credit was more important than ever, especially for the unbanked underbanked and those living in the margins. As Americans moved out of urban areas and government mandated shutdowns forced people into their homes, financial technology companies were able to extend financial services to any and all Americans with a cell phone, which increased financial inclusion and further democratized access to credit. Mr. Scharf, briefly, how did Wells Fargo partner with fintech companies to prepare for and to adapt to the digital migration we've experienced in the past year? And how did you extend your services to those previously unreached, the, the unbanked? Congressman, we partner with fintechs on a whole range of uh, things that are uh, predominantly at our digital offerings these days. Um, when the pandemic hit and uh, you know, we, we tried to keep as many branches open as we possibly can. Uh, we kept at least 70% of them open, um, but there was a significant migration on the service side, especially to use our digital offerings. Uh, it's something that we certainly talked very actively to our customers about because we thought it was a, uh, a smart and safe way for them to continue to do business with us. Uh, we saw the digital activity, depending on, you know, the month during the pandemic, either 
be up 50% or uh, be double what it was in prior periods. And so the adoption has grown significantly and a series of those underlying services uh, are built with uh, some of the power of fintechs in the background. Great. I'd like to open this question up to uh, the other witnesses and ask you to briefly describe what activities related to cryptocurrency uh, your firms are engaged in. And why don't I start with Mr. Solomon? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, we are we're restricted uh, by the regulatory structure uh, to act as a principal trader or to own uh, most cryptocurrencies. We do clear uh, Bitcoin futures. Uh, we provide advice to clients, particularly institutions uh, and high net worth individuals that have an interest in gaining exposure, although often they go to other places to gain those exposures. Great. Mr. Diamond? Exactly where Mr. Solomon is, and I don't give personal financial advice, but if you did ask me, in this case, I would tell you to stay clear of Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gorman. Uh, same position, uh, and we allow clients to invest in funds that are focused on crypto. Great. Ms. Fraser. Uh, similarly, we uh, proceed with great caution here um, and uh, are taking some tentative steps. Uh, Mr. Moynihan, good to see you. Good to see you. Um, we clear futures and we are looking at some of the other things the other colleagues do, but that's basically all we do is clear futures at this point. I, and, and now that uh, I've gone through the group, uh, Mr. Scharf, how about, how about you guys? Uh, we're, we're, we're looking at a whole series of things um, and proceeding very, very cautiously. Yeah. Seems to be a theme. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. I'm going to I'm going to uh, make it brief because I know you've been going a long time today. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Garcia, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, and to all of our uh, panelists. Uh, I'm in Chicago and I'm representing working class district and uh, many of my constituents are Latino immigrants as I am. Uh, in neighborhoods like mine, uh, it's very clear that environmental justice and racial justice are linked. Uh, Black and Latino communities suffer disproportionately from polluted air and dirty water. And we are barely consulted about issues and projects in our communities all too often. Indigenous communities face the exact same issues as pipelines are being built on their historic land despite their opposition. Uh, Mr. Diamond, your bank has made uh, public commitments to racial justice and to reaching net zero carbon emissions by 2050, which is commendable, a target that would require no new oil and gas fields. Yet JP Morgan Chase continues to do business with Enbridge, which is building its Line 3 pipeline over significant opposition from indigenous communities. Will, will your bank uh, commit to respecting treaty rights and protecting our climate by committing to stop funding en Enbridge and the Line 3 pipeline? I, any, first of all, we did not commit to net zero like you just said. We're trying to be a rational player here. Oil and gas is not going to go away. You can actually get to net zero and still produce some oil and gas, just have it offset with other technologies, et cetera. And I think that is more, the more likely outcome, even by 2050. And I don't know about Enbridge uh, in particular. I'd have to get back to you on that. I'd appreciate it, sir. And, you know, my, my follow-up question is, uh, how do you square your commitments uh, to, to oppose racism and reach net zero emissions, but we can pick that up when you provide uh, that answer. Um, uh, following up on uh, with Mr. Sharp, uh, this January, the OCC lifted one of its consent orders regarding Wells Fargo's compliance with anti-money laundering and the Bank Secrecy Act requirements. Many of the bank's legal issues boil down to a toxic high pressure culture that blamed frontline workers for decisions uh, senior management made. Since you became CEO, what new measures has Well Fargo adopted to ensure that frontline bank workers do not fear retaliation for reporting inappropriate 
or unethical conduct by management? Congressman, we've made a significant number of changes to the company in both our processes, our procedures, but also our culture. Uh, we have, just to give you a sense, from the senior management, there we will have hired 11 people from the outside of the company to fill seats on our 18-member operating committee. Almost 100 of the top 200 people are new to the company. We've put in a substantial uh, amount of infrastructure um, around uh, 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 customer feedback, employee feedback, um, independent uh, investigations um, occur. Uh, and uh, it's been a dramatic series of changes inside the company, uh, as well as the cultural change that's necessary for these things to really take root. In addition, we've changed compensation plans. Significant numbers of people have, uh, management people that is, have exited the company. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, while there's still more work to do, there's always more work to do on these things, um, it's, it's a very different company today than it was. And since you're not uh, a unionized uh, workplace, um, without union representation or just cause protections, how can you reassure frontline employees and regulators that bank workers can do their jobs without fear? We have a no retribution policy. If people believe that there is retribution, those things are looked at. We have multiple ways. Uh, of for employees to provide uh, feedback, including a new process. We're in the uh, process of rolling out to the entire company. Um, uh, this information is, is reviewed by the operating committee on a regular basis uh, and by the board of directors. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, the gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. I apologize uh, for the, the problem I had before. But let me uh, thank you for convening the hearing. And I want to welcome Ms. Frazier as the first woman ever to lead our mega banks. And hopefully uh, one day uh, we will uh, truly have diversity uh, that represents our country. But for all of the witnesses, um, uh, many, if not all of you, uh, have probably made public commitments and pledges to diversity, equity, and inclusion. You've made statements about the importance of cultivating, recruiting, and hiring, and promoting diverse talent in your companies. So in particular, uh, I want to focus on how you're cultivating diverse talent for your corporate offices in the C-suite. So as you may know, I'm a firm believer that historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, must be a part of any corporation's d and strategy. So can each of you tell me as succinctly as possible, what have you done recently within the past week, month, year to support, to invest in and cultivate talent at HBCUs? And specifically, how do HBCUs and their graduates play a direct role in your D&I strategies? That's for each of the witnesses. So I'll, I'll go first. It's Jamie Diamond, J.P. Morgan Chase. You know, I've been going to Howard and Spellman for the better part of 30 years. We hired, uh, I, know, I know the Howard number, more than 20 kids every single year. So we're recruiting far more, and we, I think we recruited 15 HBCUs. So we're bringing a lot more people at the bottom level, a lot more training. We have special programs. We just started a program to hire and train 300 black financial advisors to increase representation in financial advisors. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, senior uh, black executives. We're up 40 or 50 percent in black EDs and MDs in the last three years. Uh, and we uh, and unfortunately just lost one of our top, uh, which is part of my management team, top uh, female black uh, uh, leaders at the company, but it was bittersweet because well, we lost a wonderful shine light. She became CEO of another company, so we're also very proud of her. And uh, we're okay, making a lot so of progress, and we're, and we're doing a lot. Move? Okay, thank you, Mr. Diamond. I'm happy to go next, uh, uh, Congresswoman. Um, oh, okay. We actually recently initiated a program of scholarships for 60, uh, four year full time scholarships specifically for college uh, kids at Spelman, uh, Morehouse, and Howard, and combined with the scholarship is uh, training for 
uh, entering the workforce, um, dealing with recruiting interviews and the like. So uh, very recently that was initiated. Congresswoman, I'll go next. This is Charlie Sharp, Wells Fargo. Um, I think uh, you, know, you know one of the things that we've come to recognize is uh, you know there are there are many HBCUs in this country uh, that uh, have a wonderful talent at them. Since 2007, we've actually provided over almost 40 million dollars through scholarship funds. Um, most recently, uh, in uh, in Charlotte, we announced a series of community grants, including one to Johnson C. Smith University. Um, which included a million dollar grant uh, for minority scholarships. Um, and so, you know, we're very, very firm believers uh, uh, in what uh, HBCUs do for this country and we'll continue to support them. Uh, Congressman. Congressman, this is, uh, Congresswoman, this is David Solomon. Uh, we recruit from over 100 uh, HBCUs. We've set a goal to double the number of people that we actually bring in over the course of the next five years. We just committed $25 million to a program we call HBCU Market Madness. It's a case study training program, a competition uh, that provides scholarship aid uh, that we think is highly successful. It includes uh, H HBC eight HBCUs, including North Carolina, A&T State. Um, and so we continue to invest in that program and expand it. Yeah. And so this is, go ahead, Jane. Oh, thanks, Brian. Um, from the city end, our, our CFO is a proud graduate of Howard, and he is the vice chair there, and he's been a wonderful advocate for the work that we're doing, you know, as, as similar to the other banks with the HBCUs. We fund them, we recruit there, um, and we're very active around it. And there's such talent, there's such talented people. Um, it's excited to have them part of the firm. Uh, I'd just add a couple things. One, happy birthday. Um, but number number two, one of the perceptions we had is we all expanded our efforts to HBCUs. They needed more help on, on their career development, career pathways work. So we gave a grant to 11 of them uh, in the last year of a million dollars each so they could expand their capacity to be graduates into all the programs, especially outside the financial services industry. The other neat thing that I think we did uh, is we started an entrepreneurship center between Spelman and Morehouse with a black executive alliance that will create an entrepreneur center, which will be the first of its kind among HBC universities. And also like uh, Mr. Scharf and Wells Fargo, we are working with Mayor Lyles on trying to figure out the future role of uh, John C. Smith in Charlotte and made, made grants and trying to support that, that HBCU and its, its progress forward. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentle lady's time has expired. Uh, now we will hear from a gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Williams. You're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. To build an inclusive economy where everyone has a chance at success, we all need to we all need access to responsible financial services. Unfortunately, today, as we've discussed, we see disparities in assessing even the most fundamental of financial services. For instance, according to a 2019 FDIC survey, 13.8% of black households were unbanked, while only 2.5% of white households were. We have to break down these barriers to banking, especially for those who are most marginalized. According to the 2019 FDIC survey I referenced, nearly half of the unbanked said that they didn't have enough money to start a bank account. I'd like to pose the following yes or no question to the, to the group. Has your institution adopted any policy changes in the last year that have made it easier or more affordable for individuals with low bank balances to maintain bank accounts? Mr. Diamond? Yes, we have a great product. Uh, I don't know if it was in the last year called the Secure Account, uh, which is $4.95 a month, but you get uh, bill pay online, direct deposit, access to ATM, access to branches, no overdraft, et cetera. Uh, we, I think we have... Uh, and we hope to do a million more. So that's, uh, uh, can reach out to a lot more of the unbanked. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Ms. Frazier? 
Um, thank you very much. Yes, we, we have, we have a, a product called the Access Account that we launched back in 2014. It's now uh, about 20% of our accounts in America. It's no fee. There's no overdraft. Um, it's very easy to, to use and, to, um, and, and digitally available as part of it. We also provide our ATMs to um, 28 different partners and community banks and um, give them free access to the ATM machines to, again, drive access into areas that um, others um, we don't have a presence in. And that's been successful in, in reaching um, more of the unbanked and making it easier for them to, to bank. Thank you, Ms. Frazier. Mr. Moynihan. Yes, as uh, was stated earlier, the Safe Balance account, which is a bank, a bank on product, which a lot of us have, and uh, Jamie talked about his, and uh, Jane talked about hers, now has about two and a half million accounts in it. It's, it's about thirty percent of new sales. It is five dollars a month, no overdraft, etc. And if someone has a direct deposit of more than uh, two hundred fifty dollars a month, we offer it for free, and uh, and it's also offered free to people under the age of twenty four, college kids, uh, and high school kids, etc. And that's a growing product. And I think you'll find out from our this group, along with the BPI, which is a made which is the top 25 banks, has really been delving into this driving this bank on product really in conjunction with the FDIC, I think starting five, seven years ago. So you're going to find out all the core banks here doing the same thing and trying to push that unbanked number down. And you've seen it fall the fall in the last few few uh, surveys. And Mr. Scharf. Yes, we as well have announced a bank on product called Clear Access with uh, the same features uh, uh, that you've heard. Uh, I think uh, many of us on the call, if not all of us, have invested in MDIs, um, uh, uh, which is another source of uh, serving the uh, unbanked or underbanked population. Uh, and we, and again, I know others as well, have uh, started a financial inclusion in initiative. Ours is over 10 years. To, tr to really try and get to the unbanked population in multiple ways. Thank you. And in the same survey, about one third of the unbanked cited both high bank fees, which we've addressed, and unpredictable bank fees as barriers to getting banked. I'd like to ask the same witnesses another yes or no question. Yes or no, this time we're running out of time. Has your institution adopted any policy changes in the past year to eliminate, lower, or give customers more warning in the banking fees that you assess? Mr. Diamond, yes or no? Yes, that product does exactly that. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Frazier, yes or no? Yes. yes. Mr. Moynihan? Uh, yes. And Mr. Scharf? Yes. And I would ask that each of you please follow up and give me more details on what those notices are so that we are, have more aware as we're talking with our constituents and trying to do more in our communities. And last, we've heard a little bit about what you've done. Now I'd like each of you to share just one goal that you have to address barriers to getting individuals of diverse demographic and economic backgrounds banked. What are your plans for the future to continue to reduce this number? And we're running out of time. So um, Madam Chair, I would ask that this information be followed up with me so that I have the additional details on what we're looking towards for the future to continue to reduce this disparity in the unbanked numbers in the black community. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Williams. And I think that our witnesses heard what you said and we would expect them to get that information to you. Uh, with that, uh, I would now like to go to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Archenkloss, uh, who is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, for organizing this. I found this conversation to be edifying, and uh, I, I took only a small leave of absence, and that was to meet uh, with the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, formed six years ago to uh, help support Black entrepreneurs and Black-owned businesses in Massachusetts. They made tremendous progress. Um, and we talked about the work that they're doing to advance their mission now uh, really throughout throughout the Commonwealth. According to the Kauffman Foundation, about three quarters of new businesses struggle to find financing to fund their businesses. Uh, and the rate of small business startups as opposed to high tech growth startups has actually fallen off precipitously in the last 25 years, leading to a less dynamic economy with greater concentrations of power amongst business, big business. Uh, we also know that according to the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, black and Latino entrepreneurs higher residents and local communities at much higher rates than non-minority owned businesses do. So investing in, in black entrepreneurs and black owned businesses uh, is good for small businesses and gateway cities generally, uh, as well as for the communities in which they work. 
Um, Mr. Moynihan, I've had the opportunity to speak with uh, the president of your Massachusetts operation, uh, who's a constituent of mine about the great work that Bank of America has been doing in Massachusetts to support uh, black owned businesses. Uh, I wonder if you would be willing to, to commit to working with me and with BECMA to advance the work that they're doing, uh, whether it's a public bank or other options to support uh, black entrepreneurs and, and black owned businesses. Uh, uh, Congressman, I'd be happy to have uh, Michal uh, Chamberlain, who's who you're referring to, uh, uh, meet and figure out if we can, we can help. We've uh, invested in a lot of private equity funds in Massachusetts recently, along with other parts of the country to help bridge that capital gap, which then makes the companies uh, have the kind of equity that gets them into the mainstream lending uh, uh, practice of the of the local competitive banks. So we'll be happy to work with you. That's great to hear. I'm looking forward to working with you and with Beckman on this important mission. And and you're my constituent, so I'm, I'll know where to find you. Uh, I'd like to change gears here from small businesses to uh, the ultra wealthy and talk about uh, a bill that I co-sponsored along with Representative Ro Khan of the Stop Cheaters Act. And this is about addressing the fact that the IRS has calculated that the tax gap, which is the expected gap between revenue and actual tax revenue is about $400 billion a year. And the proposal at, the, at its core in the Stop Cheaters Act is to require businesses for, uh, excuse me, banks for individuals who make more than $400,000 a year to issue adjusted 1099s functionally that tracks the income in um, and the, the withdrawals out so that the IRS can better verify what people's actual income are and to close that tax gap and ensure that everybody is paying their fair share of taxes. Uh, there's been some pushback from the banking community about this bill. If directed by Congress, and uh, Mr. Diamond, I'll start with you here, could your banks produce these new 1099 forms to help the IRS verify income? Yes, it would take about 18 months, but I urge you, if you're going to do it, do it right. Banks are worried about the litigation, the cost, and also you, you would have to include, to be fair, cryptocurrency, investment accounts, uh, all the other people who hold and move money. Otherwise, you. you're just putting it in one industry and not the rest. Mr. Moynihan? I think for the same cautions that uh, Jamie spoke about, you know, if it's a if it's a law of land, we'll, we'll implement it. It just it, it will take time to get it right. But I think the caution would be to make sure that you think through squeezing money out of, out of the core financial system into other parts uh, of the economy as as one of the things that happen has happened traditionally when uh, only one part of the industry is asked to do something. To be respectful of time, I'll just ask if any of the other CEOs disagree with the statements made by these two previous ones to just raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll assume it's in the same vein. Seeing no other hands raised, Madam Chair, I'll yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Waters, and thank you to uh, all of our witnesses who are here today who have shared your uh, experience and expertise. Uh, I wanted to take today to focus in on um, an issue that I think is concerning to everyone, uh, and that's climate change. Uh, and we really wanted to kind of narrow in a little bit more on how we can take a collective approach to, um, to making sure that we get to where we need to be on carbon emissions. And so uh, for each of you, I just kind of wanted to start off um, and recognize that each of your firms have made a commitment to achieving net zero financed emissions by 2050, which is a key milestone for the Paris Climate Agreement. And just last week, the IEA announced that all new fossil fuel projects uh, must be stopped immediately in order to meet the Paris goal of limiting warming to 1.5 a degree centigrade. Um, so I just wanted to pose a couple of questions to kind of uh, discern a little bit about the details of uh, each of your firm's commitments. Um, so for each of you, if we could just kind of go down on a yes or no, um, are each of your firms still financing new oil and gas production? And if we can start uh, with Mr. Frazier. Yes, uh, it, it, uh, we are still financing some new ones. Okay. Uh, um, and for uh, Mr. Moynihan? 
we, we finance oil companies and we'll continue to do so to help them make the transition that we've all talked about. And, you know, at the end of the day, we'll get there with a private sector driven in innovation and investing in some new technologies. And some of these companies have the intellectual property that is superior for carbon capture storage, things that we're going to need to make this happen. And so we'll continue to help work with um, is Has anyone who has not answered not financing new oil and gas production? Take that as a no. Um, let's move on. Are any of uh, the banks represented here today um, cutting their banks' financed emissions by half uh, by 2030? Okay, none. Um, have any of the have any of you? Have any of you set uh, specific targets for a significant reduction in financed emission in uh, absolute terms in terms of carbon emissions? We we are working we are working with clients to have targets for absolute returns in emissions, and we're doing it by industry. So we haven't done all the industries yet. We've done oil, utility. Uh, um, Auto, but there are other industries, of course, pulp, paper, a whole bunch of other ones, and it's going to take a lot of hard work to do it. The clients actually want to do it. Yep, yeah, we're doing the same. But I think everybody here has a similar thing. We've made commitments now. You're literally going industry by industry to figure out those participants in that industry, what you can do to help them make the transition, and what's their rational time frame, and then. Behind that, with small, medium-sized clients, we're out educating them about what net zero means, how they're going to have to commit to it, because they're they're their customers, they're, they're people who are their vendors too, and others are making similar commitments. So the whole infrastructure has to come in line, and that takes educate. All these banks have tremendous capacity to educate the clients and help the small, medium-sized business make the same transition that these large companies have to make. And we're we're literally going industry by industry to figure it out. That's where the hard work's going on. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Warnett. And uh, Mr. Diamond, you said that uh, effort has been put in in defining absolute uh, emission targets. Has Have those been released yet, or are those currently underway? And if so, is there uh, an estimated time in which we can see those absolute commitments? They, they are not public yet, and we're also working with the clients on it. Uh, and I don't remember the exact time, time frame, but that's not a 2050 number. That's a much earlier than that. I just don't remember of 10 years or 15 years, et cetera. Okay, wonderful. Um, and, and, oh, sorry. And I believe, I believe that those are all my questions today. So thank you so much, Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, take this moment to thank all of our distinguished witnesses for their testimony today. And I'd like to thank all of the members uh, for the questions that they raised, for the in research uh, that they have done uh, to help engage our witnesses here today. Uh, we uh, at the Financial Services Committee uh, take our responsibilities very seriously, and we want to make sure that there are available banking services for everybody and that those services are fair, and we want to make sure that people of color and women are not excluded from jobs and career opportunities in the banking community. And you can see from some of the questions you were asked today uh, that we have members who are very serious about this responsibility. So again, I'm very pleased uh, that you were able to spend all of the time with us today. I know it has been two days on the Senate side and on this side, and I think that you would be grilled in some areas. We had a lot of areas of concern that we were able to talk with you about today, and we're going to be doing serious follow-up. So without objections, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you're able. So without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. Again, my sincere thanks to you. This hearing is adjourned.